Chapter 1 of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by W. Blaine Dowler. Originally released as a podcast through Bureau 42. The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. Chapter 1. The Cyclone. Dorothy lived in the midst of the great Kansas prairies with Uncle Henry, who was a farmer, and Aunt Em, who was the farmer's wife. Their house was small, for the lumber to build it had to be carried by wagon many miles. There were four walls, a floor, and a roof, which made one room, and this room contained a rusty-looking cookstove, a cupboard for the dishes, a table, three or four chairs, and the beds. Uncle Henry and Aunt Em had a big bed in one corner, and Dorothy had a little bed in another corner. There was no garret at all, and no cellar, except for a small hole dug in the ground, called the cyclone cellar, where the family could go in case one of those great whirlwinds arose, mighty enough to crush any building in its path. It was reached by a trap door in the middle of the floor, from which a ladder led down into the small dark hole. When Dorothy stood in the doorway and looked around, she could see nothing but the great gray prairie on every side. Not a tree nor a house broke the broad sweep of flat country that reached to the edge of the sky in all directions. The sun had baked the plowed land into a gray mass, with little cracks running through it. Even the grass was not green, for the sun had burned the tops of the long blades until they were the same gray color to be seen everywhere. Once the house had been painted, but the sun blistered the paint and the rains washed it away, and now the house was as dull and gray as everything else. When Aunt Em came there to live, she was a young, pretty wife. The sun and wind had changed her, too. They had taken the sparkle from her eyes and left them a sober gray. They had also taken the red from her cheeks and lips, and they were gray also. She was thin and gaunt, and never smiled now. When Dorothy, who was an orphan, first came to her, Aunt Em had been so startled by the child's laughter that she would scream and press her hand upon her heart whenever Dorothy's merry voice reached her ears, and she still looked at the girl with wonder that she could find anything to laugh at. Uncle Henry never laughed. He worked hard from morning till night and did not know what joy was. He was gray also, from his long beard to his rough boots, and he looked stern and solemn and rarely spoke. It was Toto that made Dorothy laugh and saved her from growing as gray as her other surroundings. Toto was not gray. He was a little black dog with long silky hair and small black eyes that twinkled merrily on either side of his funny wee nose. Toto played all day long and Dorothy played with him and loved him dearly. Today, however, they were not playing. Uncle Henry sat upon the doorstep and looked anxiously at the sky, which was even grayer than usual. Dorothy stood in the door with Toto in her arms and looked at the sky too. Aunt Em was washing the dishes. From the far north they heard a low wail of wind, and Uncle Henry and Dorothy could see where the long grass bowed in waves before the coming storm. There now came a sharp whistling in the air from the south, and as they turned their eyes that way they saw ripples in the grass coming from that direction also. Suddenly Uncle Henry stood up. There's a cyclone coming in, he called to his wife. I'll go look after the stock. Then he ran toward the sheds where the cows and horses were kept. Aunt Em dropped her work and came to the door. One glance told her of the danger close at hand. Quick, Dorothy, she screamed. Run for the cellar. Toto jumped out of Dorothy's arms and hid under the bed, and the girl started to get him. Aunt Em, badly frightened, threw open the trap door in the floor and climbed down the ladder into the small dark hole. Dorothy caught Toto at last and started to follow her aunt. When she was halfway across the room, there came a great shriek from the wind, and the house shook so hard that she lost her footing and sat down suddenly upon the floor. Then a strange thing happened. The house whirled around two or three times and rose slowly through the air. Dorothy felt as if she were going up in a balloon. The north and south winds met where the house stood, and made it the exact center of the cyclone. In the middle of a cyclone, the air is generally still, but the great pressure of the wind on every side of the house raised it up higher and higher until it was at the very top of the cyclone, and there it remained, and it was carried miles and miles away as easily as you could carry a feather. It was very dark, and the wind howled horribly around her, but Dorothy found she was riding quite easily. After the first few whirls around, and one other time when the house tipped badly, she felt as if she were being rocked gently, like a baby in a cradle. Toto did not like it. He ran about the room, now here, now there, barking loudly. But Dorothy sat quite still on the floor and waited to see what would happen. Once Toto got too near the open trap door and fell in, and at first the little girl thought she had lost him. But soon she saw one of his ears sticking up through the hole, for the strong pressure of the air was keeping him up so that he could not fall. She crept to the hole, caught Toto by the ear, and dragged him into the room again, afterward closing the trap door so that no more accidents could happen. Hour after hour passed away, and slowly Dorothy got over her fright, but she felt quite lonely, and the wind shrieked so loudly all about her that she nearly became deaf. At first she had wondered if she would be dashed to pieces when the house fell again, but as the hours passed and nothing terrible happened, she stopped worrying and resolved to wait calmly and see what the future would bring. 
At last she crawled over the swaying floor to her bed and lay down upon it, and Toto followed and lay down beside her. In spite of the swaying of the house and the wailing of the wind, Dorothy closed her eyes and fell fast asleep. Chapter 2 The Council with the Munchkins she was awakened by a shock so sudden and severe that if dorothy had not been lying on the soft bed she might have been hurt as it was the jar made her catch her breath and wonder what had happened and toto put his cold little nose into her face and whined dismally dorothy sat up and noticed that the house was not moving nor was it dark for the bright sunshine came in at the window flooding the little room she sprang from her bed and with toto at her heels ran and opened the door the little girl gave a cry of amazement and looked about her her eyes growing bigger and bigger at the wonderful sight she saw. The cyclone had set the house down very gently, for a cyclone, in the midst of a country of marvelous beauty. There were lovely patches of greensward all around, with stately trees bearing rich and luscious fruits. Banks of gorgeous flowers were on every hand, and birds with rare and brilliant plumage sang and fluttered in the trees and bushes. A little way off was a small brook, rushing and sparkling along between green banks, and murmuring in a voice very grateful to a little girl who had lived so long on the dry gray prairies while she stood looking eagerly at the strange and beautiful sights she noticed coming toward her a group of the queerest people she had ever seen they were not as big as the grown folks she had always been used to but neither were they very small in fact they seemed about as tall as dorothy who was a well-grown child for her age although they were so far as looks go many years older three were men and one a woman and all were oddly dressed they wore round hats that rose to a small point a foot above their heads with little bells around the brims that tinkled sweetly as they moved the hats of the men were blue the little woman's hat was white and she wore a white gown that hung in pleats from her shoulders over it were sprinkled little stars that glistened in the sun like diamonds the men were dressed in blue of the same shade as their hats and wore well-polished boots with a deep roll of blue at the tops the men dorothy thought were about as old as uncle henry for two of them had beards but the little woman was doubtless much older her face was covered with wrinkles her hair was nearly white and she walked rather stiffly when these people drew near the house where dorothy was standing in the doorway they paused and whispered among themselves as if afraid to come farther but the little old woman walked up to dorothy made a low bow and said in a sweet voice you are welcome most noble sorceress to the land of the munchkins we are so grateful to you for having killed the wicked witch of the east and for setting our people free from bondage dorothy listened to the speech with wonder what could a little woman possibly mean by calling her a sorceress and saying she had killed the wicked witch of the east dorothy was an innocent harmless little girl who had been carried by a cyclone many miles from home she had never killed anything in all her life but the little woman evidently expected her to answer so dorothy said with hesitation you are very kind but there must be some mistake i have not killed anything your house did anyway replied the little old woman with a laugh and that is the same thing see she continued pointing to the corner of the house there are her two feet still sticking out from under a block of wood dorothy looked and gave a little cry of fright there indeed just under the corner of the great beam of the house rested on two feet were sticking out shod in silver shoes with pointed toes oh dear oh dear cried dorothy clasping her hands together in dismay the house must have fallen on her whatever shall we do there is nothing to be done said the little woman calmly but who was she asked dorothy she was the wicked witch of the east as i said answered the little woman she has held all the munchkins in bondage for many years making them slave for her night and day now they are all set free and are grateful to you for the favor who are the munchkins inquired dorothy they are the people who live in this land of the east where the wicked witch ruled are you a munchkin asked dorothy no but i am their friend although i live in the land of the north when they saw the witch of the east was dead the munchkins sent a swift messenger to me and i came at once i am the witch of the north oh gracious cried dorothy are you a real witch yes indeed answered the little woman but i am a good witch and the people love me i am not as powerful as the wicked witch was who ruled here or i should have set the people free myself but i thought all witches were wicked said the girl who was half frightened at facing a real witch oh no that is a great mistake there are only four witches in all the land of oz and two of them those who live in the north and the south are good witches i know this is true for i am one of them myself and cannot be mistaken those who dwelt in the east and the west were indeed wicked witches but now that you have killed one of them there is but one wicked witch in all the land of oz the one who lives in the west but said dorothy after a moment's thought aunt em has told me that the witches were all dead years and years ago who is aunt em inquired the little woman she is my aunt who lives in kansas where i came from the witch of the north seemed to think for a time with her head bowed and her eyes upon the ground then she looked up and said i do not know where kansas is for i have never heard that country mentioned before 
But tell me, is it a civilized country? Oh, yes, replied Dorothy. Then that accounts for it. In the civilized countries, I believe there are no witches left, nor wizards, nor sorceresses, nor magicians. But you see, the land of Oz has never been civilized, for we are cut off from all the rest of the world. Therefore, we still have witches and wizards amongst us. Who are the wizards? asked Dorothy. Oz himself is the great wizard, answered the witch, sinking her voice to a whisper. He is more powerful than all the rest of us together. He lives in the city of emeralds. Dorothy was going to ask another question. But just then the munchkins, who had been standing silently by, gave a loud shout and pointed to the corner of the house where the wicked witch had been lying. What is it? asked the little old woman and looked and began to laugh. The feet of the dead witch had disappeared entirely and nothing was left but the silver shoes. She was so old, explained the witch of the north, that she dried up quickly in the sun. That is the end of her. But the silver shoes are yours and you shall have them to wear. She reached down and picked up the shoes and after shaking the dust out of them, handed them to Dorothy. The witch of the east was proud of those silver shoes, said one of the munchkins, and there is some charm connected with them, but what it is we never knew. Dorothy carried the shoes into the house and placed them on the table. Then she came out again to the munchkins and said, I am anxious to get back to my aunt and uncle, for I am sure they will worry about me. Can you help me find my way? The munchkins and the witch first looked at one another and then at Dorothy, and then shook their heads. At the east, not far from here, said one, there is a great desert, and none could live to cross it. It is the same at the south, said another, for I have been there and seen it. The south is the country of the quadlings. I am told, said the third man, that it is the same at the west, and that country where the Winkies live is ruled by the wicked witch of the west, who would make you her slave if you passed her way. The north is my home, said the old lady, and at its edge is the same great desert that surrounds this land of Oz. I'm afraid, my dear, you will have to live with us. Dorothy began to sob at this, for she felt lonely among all these strange people. Her tears seemed to grieve the kind-hearted munchkins, for they immediately took out their handkerchiefs and began to weep also. As for the little old woman, she took off her cap and balanced the point on the end of her nose while she counted one, two, three, in a solemn voice. At once the cap changed to a slate, on which was written in big white chalk marks, Let Dorothy go to the City of Emeralds. The little old woman took the slate from her nose and, having read the words on it, asked, Is your name Dorothy, my dear? Yes, answered the child, looking up and drying her tears. Then you must go to the City of Emeralds. Perhaps Oz will help you. Where is this city? asked Dorothy. It is exactly in the center of the country and is ruled by Oz, the great wizard I told you of. Is he a good man? inquired the girl anxiously. He is a good wizard. Whether he is a man or not, I cannot tell, for I have never seen him. How can I get there? asked Dorothy. You must walk. It is a long journey, through a country that is sometimes pleasant and sometimes dark and terrible. However, I will use all the magic arts I know of to keep you from harm. Won't you go with me? pleaded the girl who had begun to look upon the little old woman as her only friend. No, I cannot do that, she replied. But I will give you my kiss, and no one will dare injure a person who has been kissed by the Witch of the North. She came close to Dorothy and kissed her gently on the forehead, where her lips touched the girl they left a round, shining mark, as Dorothy found out soon after. The road to the City of Emeralds is paved with yellow brick, said the witch, so you cannot miss it. When you get to Oz, do not be afraid of him, but tell your story and ask him to help you. Goodbye, my dear. The three munchkins bowed low to her and wished her a pleasant journey, after which they walked away through the trees. The witch gave Dorothy a friendly little nod, whirled around on her left heel three times, and straightway disappeared, much to the surprise of little Toto, who barked after her loudly enough when she was gone, because he had been afraid even to growl while she stood by. But Dorothy, knowing her to be a witch, had expected her to disappear in just that way, and was not surprised in the least. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by W. Blaine Dowler, originally released through Bureau 42. Chapter 3 How Dorothy Saved the Scarecrow. When Dorothy was left alone, she began to feel hungry. So she went to the cupboard and cut herself some bread, which she spread with butter. She gave some to Toto, and taking a pail from the shelf, she carried it down to the little brook and filled it with clear, sparkling water. Toto ran over to the trees and began to bark at the birds sitting there. Dorothy went to get him, and saw such delicious fruit hanging from the trees that she gathered some of it, finding it just what she wanted to help out her breakfast. Then she went back to the house, and having helped herself and Toto to a good drink of the cool, clear water, she set about making ready for the journey to the City of Emeralds. Dorothy had only one other dress, but that happened to be clean and was hanging on a peg beside her bed. It was gingham, with checks of white and blue, and although the blue was somewhat faded with many washings, it was still a pretty frock. The girl washed herself carefully, 
dressed herself in the clean gingham, and tied her pink sub-bonnet to her head. She took a little basket and filled it with bread from the cupboard, laying a white cloth over the top. Then she looked down at her feet and noticed how old and worn her shoes were. They surely will never do for a long journey, Toto, she said. And Toto looked up into her face with his little black eyes and wagged his tail to show he knew what she meant. At that moment Dorothy saw lying on the table the silver shoes that had belonged to the Witch of the East. I wonder if they will fit me, she said to Toto. They would be just the thing to take a long walk in, for they could not wear out. She took off her old leather shoes and tried on the silver ones, which fitted her as well as if they had been made for her. Finally, she picked up her basket. Come along, Toto, she said. We will go to the Emerald City and ask the Great Oz how to get back to Kansas again. She closed the door, locked it, and put the key carefully in the pocket of her dress. And so, with Toto trotting along soberly behind her, she started on her journey. There were several roads nearby, but it did not take her long to find the one paved with yellow bricks. Within a short time, she was walking briskly toward the Emerald City her silver shoes tinkling merrily on the hard yellow road bed. The sun shone bright and the birds sang sweetly, and Dorothy did not feel nearly so bad as you might think a little girl would who had been suddenly whisked away from her own country and set down in the midst of a strange land. She was surprised as she walked along to see how pretty the country was about her. There were neat fences at the sides of the road, painted a dainty blue color, and beyond them were fields of grain and vegetables in abundance evidently the munchkins were good farmers and able to raise large crops once in a while she would pass a house and the people came out to look at her and bow low as she went by for everyone knew she had been the means of destroying the wicked witch and setting them free from bondage the houses of the munchkins were odd-looking dwellings for each was round with a big dome for a roof all were painted blue for in this country of the east blue was the favorite color toward evening when dorothy was tired with her long walk and began to wonder where she would pass the night she came to a house rather larger than the rest on the green lawn before it many men and women were dancing five little fiddlers played as loudly as possible and the people were laughing and singing while a big table nearby was loaded with delicious fruits and nuts pies and cakes and many other good things to eat the people greeted dorothy kindly and invited her to supper and to pass the night with them for this was the home of one of the richest munchkins in the land and his friends were gathered with him to celebrate their freedom from the bondage of the wicked witch dorothy ate a hearty supper and was waited upon by the rich munchkin himself whose name was bok then she sat upon a settee and watched the people dance when bok saw her silver shoes he said you must be a great sorceress why asked the girl because you wear silver shoes and have killed the wicked witch besides you have white in your frock and only witches and sorceresses wear white my dress is blue and white checked said dorothy smoothing out the wrinkles in it it is kind of you to wear that said bok blue is the color of the munchkins and white is the witch color so we know you are a friendly witch Dorothy did not know what to say to this, for all the people seemed to think her a witch, and she knew very well she was only an ordinary little girl who had come by chance of a cyclone into a strange land. When she had tired watching the dancing, Bog led her into the house, where he gave her a room with a pretty bed in it. The sheets were made of blue cloth, and Dorothy slept soundly in them till morning, with Toto curled up on the blue rug beside her. She ate a hearty breakfast, and watched a wee munchkin baby, who played with Toto and pulled his tail and crowed and laughed in a way that greatly amused Dorothy. Toto was a fine curiosity to all the people, for they had never seen a dog before. How far is it to the Emerald City? the girl asked. I do not know, answered Bok gravely, for I have never been there. It is better for people to keep away from Oz unless they have business with them. But it is a long way to the Emerald City, and it will take you many days. The country here is rich and pleasant, but you must pass through rough and dangerous places before you reach the end of your journey. This worried Dorothy a little, but she knew that only the great Oz could help her get back to Kansas again so she bravely resolved not to turn back. She bade her friends goodbye and again started along the road of yellow brick. When she had gone several miles, she thought she would stop to rest, and so climbed to the top of the fence beside the road and sat down. There was a great cornfield beyond the fence, and not far away she saw a scarecrow placed high up on a pole to keep the birds from the ripe corn. Dorothy leaned her chin upon her hand and gazed thoughtfully at the scarecrow. Its head was a small sack stuffed with straw, with eyes, nose, and mouth painted on it to represent a face. An old blue pointed hat that had belonged to some munchkin was perched on his head, and the rest of the figure was a blue suit of clothes, worn and faded, which had also been stuffed with straw. On the feet were some old boots with blue tops, such as every man wore in this country, and the figure was raised above the stalks of corn by means of the pole stuck up in its back. While Dorothy was looking earnestly into the queer painted face of the scarecrow, she was surprised to see one of the eyes slowly wink at her. She thought she must have been mistaken at first, for none of the scarecrows in Kansas ever wink but presently the figure nodded its head to her in a friendly way. Then she climbed down from the fence and walked up to it, while Toto ran around the pole and barked. Good day, said the scarecrow in a rather husky voice. 
did you speak asked the girl in wonder certainly answered the scarecrow how do you do i'm pretty well thank you replied dorothy politely how do you do i'm not feeling well said the scarecrow with a smile for it is very tedious being perched up here night and day to scare away crows can't you get down asked dorothy no for this pole is stuck up my back if you will please take away the pole i shall be greatly obliged to you dorothy reached up both arms and lifted the figure off the pole for being stuffed with straw it was quite light thank you very much said the scarecrow when he had been set down on the ground i feel like a new man dorothy was puzzled at this for it sounded queer to hear a stuffed man speak and to see him bow and walk along beside her who are you asked the scarecrow when he had stretched himself and yawned and where are you going my name is dorothy said the girl and i am going to the emerald city to ask the great oz to send me back to kansas where is the emerald city he inquired and who is oz why don't you know she returned in surprise no indeed i don't know anything you see i am stuffed so i have no brains at all he answered sadly oh said dorothy i'm awfully sorry for you do you think he asked if i go to the emerald city with you that oz would give me some brains i cannot tell she returned but you may come with me if you like if oz will not give you any brains you will be no worse off than you are now that is true said the scarecrow you see he continued confidentially i don't mind my legs and arms and body being stuffed because i cannot get hurt if anyone treads on my toes or sticks a pin into me it doesn't matter for i can't feel it but i do not want people to call me a fool and if my head stays stuffed with straw instead of brains as yours is how am i ever to know anything i understand how you feel said the little girl who was truly sorry for him if you will come with me i'll ask oz to do all he can for you thank you he answered gratefully they walked back to the road dorothy helped him over the fence and they started along the path of yellow brick for the emerald city toto did not like this addition to the party at first he smelled around the stuffed man as if he suspected there might be a nest of rats in the straw and he often growled in an unfriendly way at the scarecrow don't mind toto said dorothy to her new friend he never bites oh i'm not afraid replied the scarecrow he can't hurt the straw do let me carry that basket for you i shall not mind it for i can't get tired i'll tell you a secret he continued as he walked along there's only one thing in the world i am afraid of what is that asked dorothy the munchkin farmer who made you no answered the scarecrow it's a lighted match chapter four the road through the forest after a few hours the road began to be rough and the walking grew so difficult that the scarecrow often stumbled over the yellow bricks which were here very uneven sometimes indeed they were broken or missing altogether leaving holes that toto jumped across and dorothy walked around as for the scarecrow having no brains he walked straight ahead and so stepped into the holes and fell at full length on the hard bricks it never hurt him however and dorothy would pick him up and set him on upon his feet again while he joined her in laughing merrily at his own mishap the farms were not nearly so well cared for here as they were farther back there were fewer houses and fewer fruit trees and the farther they went the more dismal and lonesome the country became at noon they sat down by the roadside near a little brook and dorothy opened her basket and got out some bread she offered a piece to the scarecrow but he refused i am never hungry he said and it is a lucky thing i am not for my mouth is only painted and if i should cut a hole in it so i could eat the straw i am stuffed with would come out and that would spoil the shape of my head dorothy saw at once that this was true so she only nodded and went on eating her bread tell me something about yourself and the country you came from said the scarecrow when she had finished her dinner so she told him all about kansas and how gray everything was there and how the cyclone had carried her to this queer land of oz the scarecrow listened carefully and said i cannot understand why you should wish to leave this beautiful country and go back to the dry gray place you call kansas that is because you have no brains answered the girl no matter how dreary and gray our homes are we people of flesh and blood would rather live there than in any other country be it ever so beautiful there is no place like home the scarecrow sighed of course i cannot understand it he said if your heads were stuffed with straw like mine you would probably all live in the beautiful places and then kansas would have no people at all it is fortunate for kansas that you have brains won't you tell me a story while we are resting asked the child the scarecrow looked at her reproachfully and answered my life has been so short that i really know nothing whatever i was only made day before yesterday what happened in the world before that time is all unknown to me luckily when the farmer made my head one of the first things he did was to paint my ears so that i heard what was going on there was another munchkin with him and the first thing i heard was the farmer saying how do you like those ears they aren't straight answered the other never mind said the farmer they are ears just the same which was true enough now i'll make the eyes said the farmer so he painted my right eye and as soon as it was finished i found myself looking at him and everything around me with a great deal of curiosity for this was my first glimpse of the world that's a rather pretty eye remarked the munchkin who was watching the farmer blue paint is just the color for eyes i think i'll make the other one a little bigger said the farmer and when the second eye was done i could see much better than before then he made my nose and mouth but i did not speak because at that time i didn't know what a mouth was for i had the fun of watching them make my body and my arms and legs 
and when they fastened on my head at last i felt very proud for i thought i was just as good a man as any one this fellow will scare the crows fast enough said the farmer he looks just like a man why he is a man said the other and i quite agreed with him the farmer carried me under his arm to the cornfield and set me up on a tall stalk where you found me he and his friend soon after walked away and left me alone i did not like to be deserted this way so i tried to walk after them but my feet would not touch the ground and i was forced to stay on the pole it was a lonely life to lead for i had nothing to think of having been made such a little while before many crows and other birds flew into the cornfield but as soon as they saw me they flew away again thinking i was a munchkin and this pleased me and made me feel that i was quite an important person by and by an old crow flew near me and after looking at me carefully he perched upon my shoulder and said i wonder if that farmer thought to fool me in this clumsy manner any crow of sense could see that you were only stuffed with straw then he hopped down at my feet and ate all the corn he wanted the other birds seeing he was not harmed by me came to eat the corn too so in a short time there was a great flock of them about me i felt sad at this for it showed i was not such a good scarecrow after all but the old crow comforted me saying if only you had brains in your head you would be as good a man as any of them and a better man than some of them brains are the only things worth having in this world no matter whether one is a crow or a man after the crows had gone i thought this over and i decided i would try hard to get some brains by good luck you came along and pulled me off the stake and from what you say i am sure the great oz will give me brains as soon as we get to the emerald city i hope so said dorothy earnestly since you seem anxious to have them oh yes i am anxious returned the scarecrow it is such an uncomfortable feeling to know one is a fool well said the girl let us go and she handed the basket to the scarecrow there were no fences at all by the roadside now and the land was rough and untilled toward evening they came to a great forest where the trees grew so big and close together that their branches met over the road of yellow brick it was almost dark under the trees for the branches shut out the daylight but the travellers did not stop and went on into the forest if this road goes in it must come out said the scarecrow and as the emerald city is at the other end of the road we must go wherever it leads us anyone would know that said dorothy certainly that is why i know it returned the scarecrow if it required brains to figure it out i never should have said it after an hour or so the light faded away and they found themselves stumbling along in the darkness dorothy could not see at all but toto could for some dogs see very well in the dark and the scarecrow declared he could see as well as by day so she took hold of his arm and managed to get along fairly well if you see any house or any place where we can pass the night she said you must tell me for it is very uncomfortable walking in the dark soon after the scarecrow stopped i see a little college at the right of us he said built of logs and branches shall we go there yes indeed answered the child i am all tired out so the scarecrow led her through the trees until they reached the cottage and dorothy entered and found a bed of dried leaves in one corner she lay down at once and with toto beside her soon fell into a sound sleep the scarecrow who was never tired stood up in another corner and waited patiently until morning came End of chapter four chapter five of the wonderful wizard of oz by l frank baum this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by w blaine dowler originally released through bureau forty two chapter five the rescue of the tin woodman when dorothy awoke the sun was shining through the trees and toto had long been out chasing birds around him and squirrels she sat up and looked around her scarecrow still standing patiently in his corner waiting for her we must go and search for water she said to him why do you want water he asked to wash my face clean after the dust of the road and to drink so the dry bread will not stick in my throat it must be inconvenient to be made of flesh said the scarecrow thoughtfully for you must sleep eat and drink however you have brains and it is worth a lot of bother to be able to think properly they left the cottage and walked through the trees until they found a little spring of clear water where dorothy drank and bathed and ate her breakfast she saw there was not much bread left in the basket and the girl was thankful the scarecrow did not have to eat anything for there was scarcely enough for her and toto for the day when she finished her meal and was about to go back to the road of yellow brick she was startled to hear a deep groan near by what was that she asked timidly i cannot imagine replied the scarecrow but we can go and see just then another groan reached their ears and the sound seemed to come from behind them they turned and walked through the forest a few steps when dorothy discovered something shining in a ray of sunshine that fell between the trees she ran to the place and then stopped short with a little cry of surprise one of the big trees had been partly chopped through and standing beside it with an uplifted axe in his hands was a man made entirely of tin his head and arms and legs were jointed upon his body but he stood perfectly motionless as if he could not stir at all dorothy looked at him in amazement and so did the scarecrow while toto barked sharply and made a snap at the tin legs which hurt his teeth did you groan asked dorothy yes answered the tin man i did 
I've been groaning for more than a year, and no one has ever heard me before or come to help me. What can I do for you? she inquired softly, for she was moved by the sad voice in which the man spoke. Get an oil can and oil my joints, he answered. They are rusted so badly that I cannot move them at all. If I am well oiled, I shall soon be all right again. You will find an oil can on a shelf in my cottage. Dorothy at once ran back to the cottage and found the oil can, and then she returned and asked anxiously, Where are your joints? Oil my neck first replied the tin woodman. So she oiled it, and as it was quite badly rusted, the scarecrow took hold of the tin head and moved it gently from side to side until it worked freely, and then the man could turn it himself. Now oil the joints of my arms, he said, and Dorothy oiled them, and the scarecrow bent them carefully until they were quite free from rust and as good as new. The tin woodman gave a sigh of satisfaction and lowered his axe, which he leaned against the tree. This is a great comfort, he said. I have been holding that axe in the air ever since I rested, and I am glad to be able to put it down at last. Now if you will oil the joints on my legs, I shall be all right once more. So they oiled his legs until he could move them freely, and he thanked them again and again for his release, for he seemed a very polite creature and very grateful. I might have stood there always if you had not come along, he said. So you have certainly saved my life. How did you happen to be here? We are on our way to the Emerald City to see the great Oz, she answered, and we stopped at your cottage to pass the night. Why do you wish to see Oz? he asked. I want him to send me back to Kansas, and the scarecrow wants him to put a few brains into his head, she replied. The tin woodman appeared to think deeply for a moment. Then he said, Do you suppose Oz could give me a heart? Why, I guess so, Dorothy answered. It would be as easy as to give the scarecrow brains. True, the tin woodman returned. So if you will allow me to join your party, I will also go to the Emerald City and ask Oz to help me. Come along, said the scarecrow heartily, and Dorothy added that she would be pleased to have his company. So the tin woodman shouldered his axe, and they all passed through the forest until they came to the road that was paved with yellow brick. The tin woodman had asked Dorothy to put the oil can in her basket, for, he said, if I should get caught in the rain and rust again, I would need the oil can badly. It was a bit of good luck to have their new comrade join the party, for soon after they had begun their journey again, they came to a place where the trees and branches grew so thick over the road that the travelers could not pass. But the tin woodman set to work with his axe and chopped so well that soon he cleared a passage for the entire party. Dorothy was thinking so earnestly as they walked along that she did not notice when the scarecrow stumbled into a hole and rolled over to the side of the road. Indeed, he was obliged to call her to her to help him up again. Why didn't you walk around the hole? asked the tin woodman. I didn't know enough, replied the scarecrow cheerfully. My head is stuffed with straw, you know, and that is why I am going to Oz to ask him for some brains. Oh, I see, said the tin woman. But after all, brains are not the best things in the world. Have you any? inquired the scarecrow. No, my head is quite empty, answered the woodman. But once I had brains and a heart also. So, having tried them both, I should much rather have a heart. And why is that? asked the scarecrow. I will tell you my story, and then you will know. So while they were walking through the forest, the tin woodman told the following story. I was born the son of a woodman who chopped down trees in the forest and sold the wood for a living. When I grew up, I too became a woodchopper. And after my father died, I took care of my old mother as long as she lived. Then I made up my mind that instead of living alone I would marry, so that I might not become lonely. There was one of the munchkin girls who was so beautiful that I soon grew to love her with all my heart. She, on her part, promised to marry me as soon as I could earn enough money to build a better house for her. So I set to work harder than ever, but the girl lived with an old woman who did not want her to marry anyone, for she was so lazy she wished the girl to remain with her and do the cooking and the housework. So the old woman went to the Wicked Witch of the East and promised her two sheep and a cow if she would prevent the marriage. Thereupon the wicked witch enchanted my axe, and when I was chopping away at my best one day, for I was anxious to get the new house and my wife as soon as possible, the axe slipped all at once and cut off my left leg. This at first seemed a great misfortune, for I knew a one-legged man could not do very well as a woodchopper. So I went to a tinsmith and had him make me a new leg out of tin. The leg worked very well once I was used to it, but my action angered the wicked witch of the east, for she had promised the old woman I should not marry the pretty munchkin girl. When I began chopping again, my axe slipped and cut off my right leg. Again I went to the tinsmith, and again he made me a leg out of tin. After this, the enchanted axe cut off my arms, one after the other, but, nothing daunted, I had them replaced with tin ones. The wicked witch then made the axe slip and cut off my head, and at first I thought that was the end of me. But the tinsmith happened to come along, and he made me a new head out of tin. I thought I had beaten the wicked witch then, and I worked harder than ever, but I little knew how cruel my enemy could be. She thought of a new way to kill my love for the beautiful munchkin maiden, and made my axe slip again so that it cut right through my body, splitting me into two halves. Once more the tinsmith came to my help and made me a body of tin, fastening my tin arms and legs and head to it by means of joints, so that I could move around as well as ever. But alas, 
I had now no heart, so that I lost all my love for the munchkin girl, and did not care whether I married her or not. I suppose she is still living with the old woman, waiting for me to come after her. My body shone so brightly in the sun that I felt very proud of it, and it did not matter now if my axe slipped, for it could not cut me. There was only one danger, that my joints would rust, but I kept an oil can in my cottage and took care to oil myself whenever I needed it. However, there came a day when I forgot to do this, and, being caught in a rainstorm, before I thought of the danger, my joints had rusted, and I was left to stand in the woods until you came to help me. It was a terrible thing to undergo, but during the year I stood there, I had time to think that the greatest loss I had known was the loss of my heart. While I was in love, I was the happiest man on earth. But no one can love who has not a heart, and so I am resolved to ask Oz to give me one. If he does, I will go back to the munchkin maiden and marry her. Both Dorothy and the Scarecrow had been greatly interested in the story of the Tin Woodman, and now they knew why he was so anxious to get a new heart. All the same, said the Scarecrow, I shall ask for brains instead of a heart, for a fool would not know what to do with a heart if he had one. I shall take the heart, returned the Tin Woodman, for brains do not make one happy, and happiness is the best thing in the world. Dorothy did not say anything, for she was puzzled to know which of her two friends was right, and she decided if she could only get back to Kansas and Antem, it did not matter so much whether the Woodman had no brains and the Scarecrow no heart, or each got what he wanted. What worried her most was that the bread was nearly gone, and another meal for herself and Toto would empty the basket. To be sure, neither the woodman nor the scarecrow ever ate anything, but she was not made of tin or straw, and could not live unless she was fed. Chapter 6 The Cowardly Lion All this time Dorothy and her companions had been walking through the thick woods. The road was still paved with yellow brick, but these were much covered by dried branches and dead leaves from the trees, and the walking was not at all good. There were few birds in this part of the forest, for birds loved the open country where there was plenty of sunshine. But now and then there came a deep growl from some wild animal hidden among the trees. These sounds made the little girl's heart beat fast, for she did not know what made them. But Toto knew, and he walked close to Dorothy's side and did not even bark in return. How long will it be, the child asked of the tin woman, before we are out of the forest? I cannot tell, was the answer, for I have never been to the Emerald City. But my father went there once when I was a boy, and he said it was a long journey through a dangerous country, although nearer to the city where Oz dwells the country is beautiful. But I am not afraid so long as I have my oil can, and nothing can hurt the scarecrow. Will you bear upon your forehead the mark of the good witch's kiss, and that will protect you from harm? But Toto, said the girl anxiously, what will protect him? We must protect him ourselves if he is in danger, replied the tin woodman. Just as he spoke there came from the forest a terrible roar, and the next moment a great lion bounded into the road. With one blow of his paw he sent the scarecrow spinning over and over to the edge of the road, and then he struck at the tin woodman with his sharp claws. But to the lion's surprise, he could make no impression on the tin, although the woodman fell over in the road and lay still. Little Toto, now that he had an enemy to face, ran barking toward the lion, and the great beast had opened his mouth to bite the dog when Dorothy, fearing Toto would be killed, and heedless of danger, rushed forward and slapped the lion upon his nose as hard as she could, while she cried out, Don't you dare bite Toto! You ought to be ashamed of yourself, a big beast like you, to bite a poor little dog. I didn't bite him, said the lion as he rubbed his nose with his paw where Dorothy had hit it. No, but you tried to, she retorted. You are nothing but a big coward. I know it, said the lion, hanging his head in shame. I've always known it. But how can I help it? I don't know, I'm sure. To think of your striking a stuffed man like the poor scarecrow. Is he stuffed? asked the lion in surprise as he watched her pick up the scarecrow and set him upon his feet while she patted him into shape again. Of course he's stuffed, replied Dorothy, who was still angry. That's why he went over so easily, remarked the lion, and astonished me to see him whirl around so. Is the other one stuffed also? No, said Dorothy, he's made of tin, and she helped the woodman up again. That's why he nearly blunted my claws, said the lion. When they scratched against the tin, it made a cold shiver run down my back. What is that little animal you are so tender of? He is my dog, Toto, answered Dorothy. Is he made of tin or stuffed? asked the lion. Neither, he's a, a, a meat dog, said the girl. Oh, he's a curious animal and seems remarkably small now that I look at him. No one would think of biting such a little thing except a coward like me, continued the lion sadly. What makes you a coward? asked Dorothy, looking at the great beast in wonder, for he was as big as a small horse. It's a mystery, replied the lion. I suppose I was born that way. All the other animals in the forest naturally expect me to be brave, for the lion is everywhere thought to be the king of beasts. I learned that if I roared very loudly, every living thing was frightened and got out of my way. Whenever I've met a man, I've been awfully scared but I just roared at him, and he has always run away as fast as he could go. If the elephants and the tigers and the bears had ever tried to fight me, I should have run myself. I'm such a coward. But just as soon as they hear me roar, they all try to get away from me. And of course I let them go. But that isn't right. The king of beasts shouldn't be a coward, said the scarecrow. 
I know it, returned the lion, wiping a tear from his eye with the tip of his tail. It is my great sorrow and makes my life very unhappy. But whenever there is danger, my heart begins to beat fast. Perhaps you have heart disease, said the tin woman. It may be, said the lion. If you have, continued the tin woman, you ought to be glad, for it proves you have a heart. For my part, I have no heart, so I cannot have heart disease. Perhaps, said the lion thoughtfully, if I had no heart, I should not be a coward. Have you brains? asked the scarecrow. I suppose so. I've never looked to see, replied the lion. I am going to the great Oz to ask him to give me some, remarked the scarecrow, for my head is stuffed with straw. And I am going to ask him to give me a heart, said the woodman. And I am going to ask him to send Toto and me back to Kansas, added Dorothy. Do you think Oz could give me courage? asked the cowardly lion. Just as easily as he could give me brains, said the scarecrow. Or give me a heart, said the tin woodman. Or send me back to Kansas, said Dorothy. Then if you don't mind, I'll go with you, said the lion, for my life is simply unbearable without a bit of courage. You will be very welcome, answered Dorothy, for you will help to keep away the other wild beasts. It seems to me they must be more cowardly than you are if they allow you to scare them so easily. They really are, said the lion, but that doesn't make me any braver, and as long as I know myself to be a coward, I shall be unhappy. So once more the little company set off upon the journey, the lion walking with stately strides at Dorothy's side. Toto did not approve of this new comrade at first for he could not forget how nearly he had been crushed between the lion's great jaws but after a time he became more at ease and presently toto and the cowardly lion had grown to be good friends during the rest of that day there was no other adventure to mar the peace of their journey once indeed the tin woodman stepped upon a beetle that was crawling along the road and killed the poor little thing this made the tin woodman very unhappy for he was always careful not to hurt any living creature and as he walked along he wept several tears of sorrow and regret these tears ran slowly down his face and over the hinges of his jaw and there they rested when Dorothy presently asked him a question, the tin woodman could not open his mouth, for his jaws were tightly rusted together. He became greatly frightened at this, and made many motions to Dorothy to relieve him, but she could not understand. The lion was also puzzled to know what was wrong, but the scarecrow seized the oil can from Dorothy's basket and oiled the woodman's jaws, so that after a few moments he could talk as well as before. This will serve me a lesson, said he, to look where I step, for if I should kill another bug or beetle, I should surely cry again, and crying rest my jaws so I cannot speak. Thereafter he walked very carefully, with his eyes on the road, and when he saw a tiny ant toiling by, he would step over it, so as not to harm it. The tin woodman knew very well he had no heart, and therefore he took great care never to be cruel or unkind to anything. You people with hearts, he said, have something to guide you, and need never do wrong, but I have no heart, and so I must be very careful. When Oz gives me a heart, of course, I needn't mind so much. End of chapter 6《Chapter Seven of the Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by W. Blaine Dowler. Originally released through Bureau Forty Two. Chapter Seven: The Journey to the Great Oz. They were obliged to camp out that night under a large tree in the forest, for there were no houses near. The tree made a good thick covering to protect them from the dew, and the Tin Woodman chopped a great pile of wood with his axe, and Dorothy built a splendid fire that warmed her and made her feel less lonely she and toto ate the last of their bread and now she did not know what they would do for breakfast if you wish said the lion i will go into the forest and kill the deer for you you can roast it by the fire since your tastes are so peculiar that you prefer cooked food and then you will have a very good breakfast don't please don't begged the tin woodman i should certainly weep if you killed a poor deer and then my jaws would rust again but the lion went away into the forest and found his own supper and no one ever knew what it was for he didn't mention it and the scarecrow found a tree full of nuts and filled dorothy's basket with them so that she would not go hungry for a long time. She thought this was very kind and thoughtful of the scarecrow, but she laughed heartily at the awkward way in which the poor creature picked up the nuts. His padded hands were so clumsy and the nuts were so small that he dropped almost as many as he put in the basket. But the scarecrow did not mind how long it took him to fill the basket, for it enabled him to keep away from the fire, as he feared a spark might get into his straw and burn him up. So he kept a good distance away from the flames and only came near to cover Dorothy with dry leaves when she lay down to sleep. These kept her very snug and warm, and she slept soundly until morning. When it was daylight, the girl bathed her face in a little rippling brook, and soon after they all started toward the Emerald City. This was to be an eventful day for the travelers. They had hardly been walking an hour when they saw before them a great ditch that crossed the road and divided the forest as far as they could see on either side. It was a very wide ditch, and when they crept up to the edge and looked into it, they could see it was also very deep, and there were many big, jagged rocks at the bottom. The sides were so steep that none of them could climb down, and for a moment it seemed that their journey must end. What shall we do? asked Dorothy despairingly. I haven't the faintest idea, said the tin woodman, and the lion shook his shaggy mane and looked thoughtful. 
But the scarecrow said, We cannot fly, that is certain. Neither can we climb down into this great ditch. Therefore, if we cannot jump over it, we must stop where we are. I think I could jump over it, said the cowardly lion, after measuring the distance carefully in his mind. Then we are all right, answered the scarecrow, for you can carry us all over on your back, one at a time. Well, I'll try it, said the lion. Who will go first? I will, declared the scarecrow, for if you found out that you could not jump over the gulf, Dorothy would be killed, or the tin woodman badly dented on the rocks below. But if I am on your back, it will not matter so much, for the fall would not hurt me at all. I am terribly afraid of falling myself, said the cowardly lion, but I suppose there was nothing to do but try it. So get on my back, and we will make the attempt. The scarecrow sat upon the lion's back, and the big beast walked to the edge of the gulf and crouched down. Why don't you run and jump? asked the scarecrow. Because that isn't the way we lions do these things, he replied. Then, giving a great spring, he shot through the air and landed safely on the other side. They were all greatly pleased to see how easily he did it, and after the scarecrow had got down from his back, the lion sprang across the ditch again. Dorothy thought she would go next, so she took Toto in her arms and climbed on the lion's back, holding tightly to his mane with one hand. The next moment it seemed as if she were flying through the air, and then, before she had time to think about it, she was safe on the other side. The lion went back a third time and got the tin woodman, and they all sat down for a few moments to give the beast a chance to rest, for his great leaps had made his breath short, and he panted like a big dog that has been running too long. They found the forest very thick on this side, and it looked dark and gloomy. After the lion had rested, they started on the road of yellow brick, silently wondering, each in his own mind, if ever they would come to the end of the woods and reach the bright sunshine again. To add to their discomfort, they soon heard strange noises in the depths of the forest, and the lion whispered to them that it was in this part of the country that the Kaladas lived. What are the Kaladas? asked the girl. They are monstrous beasts with bodies like bears and heads like tigers, replied the lion, and with claws so long and sharp that they could tear me in two as easily as I could kill Toto. I'm terribly afraid of the Kaladas. I'm not surprised that you are, returned Dorothy. They must be dreadful beasts. The lion was about to reply when suddenly they came to another gulf across the road but this one was so broad and deep that the lion knew at once he could not leap across it. So they sat down to consider what they should do, and after serious thought the scarecrow said, Here is a great tree standing close to the ditch. If the tin woodman could chop it down so that it will fall to the other side, we can walk across it easily. That is a first-rate idea, said the lion. One would almost suspect you had brains in your head instead of straw. The woodman set to work at once, and so sharp was his axe that the tree was soon chopped nearly through. Then the lion put his strong front legs against the tree and pushed with all his might and slowly the big tree tipped and fell with a crash across the ditch, with its top branches on the other side. They had just started to cross this queer bridge when a sharp growl made them all look up, and to their horror they saw running toward them two great beasts with bodies like bears and heads like tigers. They are the Kaladas, said the cowardly lion, beginning to tremble. Quick, cried the scarecrow, let us cross over. So Dorothy went first, holding Toto in her arms, and the tin woodman followed, and the scarecrow came next. The lion, although he was certainly afraid, turned to face the Kaladas, and then he gave so loud and terrible a roar that Dorothy screamed and the scarecrow fell over backward, while even the fierce beasts stopped short and looked at him in surprise. But, seeing they were bigger than the lion, and remembering that there were two of them and only one of him, the Kaladas again rushed forward, and the lion crossed over the tree and turned to see what they would do next. Without stopping an instant, the fierce beasts also began to cross the tree, and the lion said to Dorothy, We are lost, for they will surely tear us to pieces with their sharp claws but stand close behind me and I will fight them as long as I am alive. Wait a minute, called the scarecrow. He had been thinking what was best to be done, and now he asked the woodman to chop away at the end of the tree that rested on their side of the ditch. The tin woodman began to use his axe at once, and, just as the two Kaladas were nearly across, the tree fell with a crash into the gulf, carrying the ugly, snarling brutes with it, and both were dashed to pieces on the sharp rocks at the bottom. Well, said the cowardly lion, drawing a long breath of relief, I see we are going to live a little while longer, and I am glad of it for it must be a very uncomfortable thing not to be alive. Those creatures frighten me so badly that my heart is beating yet. Ah, said the tin woodman sadly, I wish I had a heart to beat. This adventure made the travelers more anxious than ever to get out of the forest, and they walked so fast that Dorothy became tired and had to ride on the lion's back. To their great joy, the trees became thinner the farther they advanced, and in the afternoon they suddenly came upon a broad river, flowing swiftly just before them. On the other side of the water they could see the road of yellow brick running through a beautiful country, with green meadows dotted with bright flowers, and all the road bordered with trees hanging full of delicious fruits. They were greatly pleased to see this delightful country before them. How shall we cross the river? asked Dorothy. That is easily done, replied the scarecrow. The tin woodman must build us a raft so we can float to the other side. So the woodman took his axe and began to chop down small trees to make a raft, and while he was busy at this the scarecrow found on the river bank a tree full of fine fruit. This pleased Dorothy, who had eaten nothing but nuts all day, and she made a hearty meal of the ripe fruit. 
but it takes time to make a raft even when one is as industrious and untiring as the tin woodman and when night came the work was not done so they found a cosy place under the trees where they slept well until the morning and dorothy dreamed of the emerald city and of the good wizard oz who would soon send her back to her home again chapter eight the deadly poppy field our little party of travelers awakened the next morning refreshed and full of hope and dorothy breakfasted like a princess off peaches and plums from the trees beside the river behind them was the dark forest they had passed th safely through although they had suffered many discouragements but before them was a lovely sunny country that seemed to beckon them on to the emerald city to be sure the broad river now cut them off from this beautiful land but the raft was nearly done and after the tin woodman had cut a few more logs and fastened them together with wooden pins they were ready to start dorothy sat down in the middle of the raft and held toto in her arms when the cowardly lion stepped upon the raft it tipped badly for he was big and heavy but the scarecrow and the tin woodman stood upon the other end to steady it and they had long poles in their hands to push the raft through the water they got along quite well at first but when they reached the middle of the river the swift current swept the raft downstream farther and farther away from the road of yellow brick and the river grew so deep that the long poles would not touch the bottom this is bad said the tin woodman for if we cannot get to the land we shall be carried into the country of the wicked witch of the west and she will enchant us and make us her slaves and then i should get no brains said the scarecrow and i should get no courage said the cowardly lion and i should get no heart said the tin woodman and i should never get back to kansas said dorothy we must certainly get to the emerald city if we can the scarecrow continued and he pushed so hard on his long pole that it stuck fast in the mud at the bottom of the river then before he could pull it out again or let go the raft was swept away and the poor scarecrow left clinging to the pole in the middle of the river good-bye he called after them and they were very sorry to leave him indeed the tin woodman began to cry but fortunately remembered that he might rust and so dried his tears on dorothy's apron of course this was a bad thing for the scarecrow i am now worse off than when i first met dorothy he thought then i was stuck on a pole in a cornfield where i could make believe scare the crows at any rate but surely there was no use for a scarecrow stuck on a pole in the middle of a river i am afraid i shall never have any brains after all down the stream the raft floated and the poor scarecrow was left far behind then the lion said something must be done to save us i think i can swim to the shore and pull the raft after me if you will only hold fast to the tip of my tail so he sprang into the water and the tin woodman caught fast hold of his tail then the lion began to swim with all his might toward the shore it was hard work although he was so big but by and by they were drawn out of the current and then dorothy took the tin woodman's long pole and helped push the raft to the land they were all tired out when they reached the shore at last and stepped off upon the pretty green grass and they also knew that the stream had carried them a long way past the road of yellow brick that led to the emerald city what shall we do now asked the tin woodman as the lion lay down on the grass to let the sun dry him we must get back to the road in some way said dorothy the best plan will be to walk along the river bank until we come to the road again remarked the lion so when they were rested dorothy picked up her basket and they started along the grassy bank to the road from which the river had carried them it was a lovely country with plenty of flowers and fruit trees and sunshine to cheer them and had they not felt so sorry for the poor scarecrow they could have been very happy they walked along as fast as they could dorothy only stopping once to pick a beautiful flower and after a time the tin woodman cried out look then they all looked at the river and saw the scarecrow perched upon his pole in the middle of the water looking very lonely and sad what can we do to save him asked dorothy the lion and the woodman both shook their heads for they did not know so they sat down upon the bank and gazed wistfully at the scarecrow until a stork flew by who upon seeing them stopped to rest at the water's edge who are you and where are you going asked the stork i am dorothy answered the girl and these are my friends the tin woodman and the cowardly lion and we are going to the emerald city this isn't the road said the stork as she twisted her long neck and looked sharply at the queer party i know it returned dorothy but we have lost the scarecrow and are wondering how we shall get him back again where is he asked the stork over there on the river answered the little girl if he wasn't so big and heavy i would get him for you remarked the stork he isn't heavy a bit said dorothy eagerly for he is stuffed with straw and if you bring him back to us we shall thank you ever and ever so much well i'll try said the stork but if i find he is too heavy to carry i shall have to drop him in the river again so the big bird flew into the air and over the water till she came to where the scarecrow was perched upon his pole then the stork with her great claws grabbed the scarecrow by the arm and carried him into the air and back to the bank where dorothy and the lion and the tin woodman and toto were sitting when the scarecrow found himself among his friends again he was so happy that he hugged them all even the lion and toto and as they walked along he sang told de re de do at every step he felt so gay i was afraid i should have to stay in the river forever he said but the kind stork saved me and if i ever get any brains i shall find the stork again and do her some kindness in return that's all right said the stork who was flying along beside them i always like to help anyone in trouble 
but I must go now, for my babies are waiting in the nest for me. I hope you will find the Emerald City, and that Oz will help you. Thank you, replied Dorothy, and then the kind stork flew into the air and soon out of sight. They walked along, listening to the singing of the brightly colored birds, and looked at the lovely flowers, which now became so thick that the ground had carpeted with them. There were big yellow and white and blue and purple blossoms, beside great clusters of scarlet poppies, which were so brilliant in color they almost dazzled Dorothy's eyes. Aren't they beautiful? the girl asked as she breathed in the spicy scent of the bright flowers. I suppose so, answered the scarecrow. When I have brains, I shall probably like them better. If I only had a heart, I should love them, added the tin woodman. I always did like flowers, said the lion. They seem so helpless and frail, but there are none in the forest so bright as these. They now came upon more and more of the big scarlet poppies, and fewer and fewer of the other flowers, and soon they found themselves in the midst of a great meadow of poppies. Now it is well known that when there are many of these flowers together, their odor is so powerful that anyone who breathes it falls asleep, and if the sleeper is not carried away from the scent of the flowers, he sleeps on and on forever. But Dorothy did not know this, nor could she get away from the bright red flowers that were everywhere about. So presently her eyes grew heavy, and she felt she must sit down and rest to sleep. But the tin woodman would not let her do this. We must hurry and get back to the road of yellow brick before dark, he said, and the scarecrow agreed with him. So they kept walking until Dorothy could stand no longer. Her eyes closed in spite of herself, and she forgot where she was and fell among the poppies, fast asleep. What shall we do? asked the tin woodman. If we leave her here, she will die, said the lion. The smell of the flowers is killing us all. I myself can scarcely keep my eyes open, and the dog is asleep already. It was true. Toto had fallen down beside his little mistress. But the scarecrow and the tin woodman, not being made of flesh, were not troubled by the scent of the flowers. Run fast, said the scarecrow to the lion, and get out of this deadly flower bed as soon as you can. We will bring the little girl with us but if you should fall asleep you are too big to be carried. So the lion aroused himself and bounded forward as fast as he can go. In a moment he was out of sight. Let us make a chair with our hands and carry her, said the scarecrow. So they picked up Toto and put the dog in Dorothy's lap. And then they made a chair with their hands for the seat and the, their arms for the arms and carried the, the sleeping girl between them through the flowers. On and on they walked, and it seemed that the great carpet of deadly flowers that surrounded them would never end. They followed the bend of the river and at last came upon their friend the lion lying fast asleep among the poppies. The flowers had been too strong for the huge beast, and he had given up at last, and fallen only a short distance from the end of the poppy bed, where the sweet grass spread and beautiful green fields before them. We could do nothing for him, said the tin woodman sadly, for he is much too heavy to lift. We must leave him here to sleep on forever, and perhaps he will dream that he has found courage at last. I'm sorry, said the scarecrow. The lion was a very good comrade for one so cowardly, but let us go on. They carried the sleeping girl to a pretty spot beside the river far enough from the poppy field to prevent her breathing any more of the poison of the flowers, and here they laid her gently on the soft grass and waited for the fresh breeze to waken her. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by W. Blaine Dowler, originally released through Bureau 42. Chapter 9 the queen of the field mice we cannot be far from the road of yellow brick now remarked the scarecrow as he stood beside the girl for we have come nearly as far as the river carried us away the tin woodman was about to reply when he heard a low growl and turning his head which worked beautifully on hinges he saw a strange beast come bounding over the grass toward them it was indeed a great yellow wildcat and the woodman thought it must be chasing something for its ears were lying close to its head and its mouth was wide open showing two rows of ugly teeth while its red eyes glowed like balls of fire. As it came nearer, the tin woodman saw that running before the beast was a little gray field mouse, and although he had no heart, he knew it was wrong for the wildcat to try and catch such a pretty harmless creature. So the woodman raised his axe, and as the wildcat ran by, he gave it a quick blow that cut the beast's head clean off from its body, and it rolled over at his feet in two pieces. The field mouse, now that it was freed from its enemy, stopped short, and coming slowly up to the woodman, it said in a squeaky little voice, Oh, thank you. Thank you ever so much for saving my life. Don't speak of it, I beg of you, replied the woodman. I have no heart, you know, and I am careful to help all those who may need a friend, even if it happens to be only a mouse. Only a mouse, cried the little animal indignantly. Why, I am a queen, the queen of all the field mice. Oh, indeed, said the woodman, making a bow. Therefore you have done a great deed as well as a brave one in saving my life, added the queen. At that moment several mice were seen running up as fast as their little legs could carry them, and when they saw their queen they exclaimed, oh your majesty we thought you would be killed how did you manage to escape the great wildcat they all bowed so low to the little queen that they almost stood upon their heads this funny tin man she answered killed the wildcat and saved my life so hereafter you must all serve him and obey his slightest wish we will cried all the mice in a shrill chorus 
and then they scampered in all directions for toto had awakened from his sleep and seeing all these mice around him he gave one bark of delight and jumped right into the middle of the group toto had always loved to chase mice when he lived in kansas and he saw no harm in it but the tin woodman caught the dog in his arms and held him tight while he called to the mice come back come back toto shall not hurt you at this the queen of the mice stuck her head out from underneath a clump of grass and asked in a timid voice are you sure he will not bite us i will not let him said the woodman so do not be afraid one by one the mice came creeping back and toto did not bark again although he tried to get out of the woodman's arms and would have bitten him had he not known very well he was made of tin finally one of the biggest mice spoke is there anything we can do it asked to repay you for saving the life of our queen nothing that i know of answered the woodman but the scarecrow who had been trying to think but could not because his head was stuffed with straw said quickly oh yes you can save our friend the cowardly lion who is asleep in the poppy bed a lion cried the little queen why he would eat us all up oh no declared the scarecrow this lion is a coward really asked the mouse he says so himself answered the scarecrow and he would never hurt anyone who is our friend if you will help us save him i promise that he shall treat you all with kindness very well said the queen we trust you but what shall we do are there many of these mice which call you queen and are willing to obey you oh yes there are thousands she replied then send for them all to come here as soon as possible and let each one bring a long piece of string the queen turned to the mice that attended her and told them to go at once and get all her people as soon as they heard her orders they ran away in every direction as fast as possible now said the scarecrow to the tin woodman you must go to those trees by the riverside and make a truck that will carry the lion so the woodman went at once to the trees and began to work and he soon made a truck out of the limbs of trees from which he chopped away all the leaves and branches he fastened it together with wooden pegs and made the four wheels out of short pieces of a big tree trunk so fast and so well did he work that by the time the mice began to arrive the truck was all ready for them they came from all directions and there were thousands of them big mice and little mice and middle-sized mice and each one brought a piece of string in his mouth it was about this time that dorothy woke from her long sleep and opened her eyes she was greatly astonished to find herself lying upon the grass with thousands of mice standing around and looking at her timidly but the scarecrow told her about everything and turning to the dignified little mouse he said permit me to introduce you to her majesty the queen dorothy nodded gravely and the queen made a curtsy after which she became quite friendly with the little girl the scarecrow and the woodman now began to fasten the mice to the truck using the strings they had brought one end of a string was tied around the neck of each mouse and the other end to the truck of course the truck was a thousand times bigger than any of the mice who were to draw it but when all the mice had been harnessed they were able to pull it quite easily even the scarecrow and the tin woodman could sit on it and were drawn swiftly by their queer little horses to the place where the lion lay asleep after a great deal of hard work for the lion was heavy they managed to get him up on the truck then the queen hurriedly gave her people the order to start for she feared if the mice stayed among the poppies too long they would also fall asleep at first the little creatures many though they were could hardly stir the heavily loaded truck but the woodman and the scarecrow both pushed from behind and they got along better soon they rolled the lion out of the poppy bed to the green fields where he could breathe the sweet fresh air again instead of the poisonous scent of the flowers dorothy came to meet them and thanked the little mice warmly for saving her companion from death she had grown so fond of the big lion that she was glad he had been rescued then the mice were unharnessed from the truck and scampered away through the grass to their homes the queen of the mice was the last to leave if ever you need us again she said come out into the field and call we shall hear you and come to your assistance good-bye good-bye they all answered and away the queen ran while dorothy held toto tightly lest he should run after her and frighten her after this they sat down beside the lion until he should awaken and the scarecrow bought dorothy some fruit from a tree near by which she ate for her dinner chapter ten the guardian of the gate it was some time before the cowardly lion awakened for he had lain among the poppies a long while breathing in their deadly fragrance but when he did open his eyes and roll off the truck he was very glad to find himself still alive i ran as fast as i could he said sitting down and yawning but the flowers were too strong for me how did you get me out then they told him of the field mice and how they had generously saved him from death and the cowardly lion laughed and said i have always thought myself very big and terrible yet such little things as flowers came near to killing me and such small animals as mice have saved my life how strange it all is but comrades what shall we do now we must journey on until we find the road of yellow brick again said dorothy and then we can keep on to the emerald city so the lion being fully refreshed and feeling quite himself again they all started upon the journey greatly enjoying the walk through the soft fresh grass and it was not long before they reached the road of yellow brick and turned again toward the emerald city where the great oz dwelt the road was smooth and well paved now and the country was beautiful so that the travelers rejoiced in leaving the forest far behind and with it the many dangers they had met in its gloomy shades once more they could see the fences built beside the road but these were painted green 
and when they came to a small house in which a farmer evidently lived that also was painted green they passed by several of these houses during the afternoon and sometimes people came to the doors and looked at them as if they would like to ask questions but no one came near them nor spoke to them because of the great lion of which they were very much afraid the people were all dressed in clothing of a lovely emerald green color and wore peaked hats like those of the munchkins this must be the land of oz said dorothy and we are surely getting near the emerald city yes answered the scarecrow everything is green here while in the country of the munchkins blue was the favorite color but the people do not seem to be as friendly as the munchkins and i am afraid we shall be unable to find a place to pass the night i should like something to eat besides fruit said the girl and i am sure toto is nearly starved let us stop at the next house and talk to the people so when they came to a good-sized farmhouse dorothy walked boldly up to the door and knocked a woman opened it just far enough to look out and said what do you want child and why is that great lion with you we wish to pass the night with you if you will allow us answered dorothy and the lion is my friend and comrade and would not hurt you for the world is he tame asked the woman opening the door a little wider oh yes said the girl and he is a great coward too he will be more afraid of you than you are of him well said the woman after thinking it over and taking another peep at the lion if that is the case you may come in and i will give you some supper and a place to sleep so they all entered the house where there were besides the woman two children and a man the man had hurt his leg and was lying on the couch in a corner they seemed greatly surprised to see so strange a company and while the woman was busy laying the table the man asked where are you all going to the emerald city said dorothy to see the great oz oh indeed exclaimed the man are you sure that oz will see you why not she replied why it is said that he never lets anyone come into his presence i have been to the emerald city many times and it is a beautiful and wonderful place but i have never been permitted to see the great oz nor do i know of any living person who has seen him does he never go out asked the scarecrow never he sits day after day in the great throne room of his palace and even those who wait upon him do not see him face to face what is he like asked the girl it is hard to tell said the man thoughtfully you see oz is a great wizard and he can take on any form he wishes so that some say he looks like a bird some say he looks like an elephant and some say he looks like a cat to others he appears as a beautiful fairy or a brownie or in any other form that pleases him but who the real oz is when he is in his own form no living person can tell that is very strange said dorothy but we must try in some way to see him or we shall have made our journey for nothing why do you wish to see the terrible oz asked the man i want him to give me some brains said the scarecrow eagerly oh oz could do that easily enough declared the man he has more brains than he needs and i want him to give me a heart said the tin woodman that will not trouble him continued the man for oz has a large collection of hearts of all sizes and shapes and i want him to give me courage said the cowardly lion oz keeps a great pot of courage in his throne room said the man which he has covered with a golden plate to keep it from running over he'll be glad to give you some and i want him to send me back to kansas said dorothy where is kansas asked the man with surprise i don't know replied dorothy sorrowfully but it is my home and i'm sure it's somewhere very likely well oz can do anything so i suppose he will find kansas for you but first you must get to see him and that will be a hard task for the great wizard does not like to see any one and he usually has his own way but what do you want he continued speaking to toto toto only wagged his tail for strange to say he could not speak the woman now called to them that supper was ready so they gathered around the table and dorothy ate some delicious porridge and a dish of scrambled eggs and a plate of nice white bread and enjoyed her meal the lion ate some of the porridge but did not care for it saying it was made from oats and oats were food for horses not for lions the scarecrow and the tin woodman ate nothing at all toto ate a little of everything and was glad to get a good supper again the woman now gave dorothy a bed to sleep in and toto lay down beside her while the lion guarded the door of her room so that she might not be disturbed the scarecrow and the tin woodman stood up in a corner and kept quiet all night although of course they could not sleep the next morning as soon as the sun was up they started on their way and soon saw a beautiful green glow in the sky just before them that must be the emerald city said dorothy as they walked on the green glow became brighter and brighter and it seemed that at last they were nearing the end of their travels yet it was afternoon before they came to the great wall that surrounded the city it was high and thick and of a bright green color in front of them and at the end of the road of yellow brick was a big gate all studded with emeralds that glittered so in the sun that even the painted eyes of the scarecrow were dazzled by their brilliancy there was a bell beside the gate and dorothy pushed the button and heard a silvery tinkle sound within then the big gate swung slowly open and they all passed through and found themselves in a high arched room the walls of which glistened with countless emeralds before them stood a little man about the same size as the munchkins he was clothed all in green from his head to his feet and even his skin was of a greenish tint at his side was a large green box when he saw dorothy and her companions the man asked what do you wish in the emerald city we came here to see the great oz said dorothy the man was so surprised at this answer that he sat down to think it over 
It has been many years since anyone asked me to see Oz, he said, shaking his head in perplexity. He is powerful and terrible, and if you come on an idle or foolish errand to bother the wise reflections of the great wizard, he might be angry and destroy you all in an instant. But it is not a foolish errand nor an idle one, replied the scarecrow. It is important. We have been told that Oz is a good wizard. So he is, said the greed man, and he rules Emerald City wisely and well. But to those who are not honest or who approach him from curiosity, he is most terrible, and a few have even dared ask to see his face. I am the guardian of the gates, and since you demand to see the great Oz, I must take you to his palace. But first you must put on the spectacles. Why? asked Dorothy. Because if you did not wear spectacles, the brightness and glory of the Emerald City would blind you. Even those who live in the city must wear spectacles night and day. They are all locked on, for Oz so ordered it when the city was first built, and I have the only key that will unlock them. He opened the big box, and Dorothy saw that it was filled with spectacles of every size and shape. All of them had green glasses in them. The guardian of the gates found a pair that would just fit Dorothy and put them over her eyes. There were two golden bands fastened to them that passed around the back of her head, where they were locked together by a little key that was at the end of a chain the guardian of the gates wore around his neck. When they were on, Dorothy could not take them off, had she wished, but of course she did not wish to be blinded by the glare of the Emerald City, so she said nothing. Then the green man fitted spectacles for the scarecrow and the tin woodman and the lion, and even on little Toto, and all were locked fast with the key. Then the guardian of the gates put on his own glasses and told them he was ready to show them to the palace. Taking a big golden key from a peg on the wall, he opened another gate, and they all followed him through the portal into the streets of the Emerald City. End of chapter 10「and where the blocks were joined together were rows of emeralds set closely and glittering in the brightness of the sun. The window panes were of green glass. Even the sky above the city had a green tint, and the rays of the sun were green. There were many people, men, women, and children, walking about, and these were all dressed in green clothes and had greenish skins. They looked at Dorothy and her strangely assorted company with wondering eyes, and the children all ran away and hid behind their mothers when they saw the lion, but no one spoke to them. Many shops stood in the street, and Dorothy saw that everything in them was green. Green candy and green popcorn were offered for sale, as well as green shoes, green hats, and green clothes of all sorts. At one place a man was selling green lemonade, and when children bought it, Dorothy could see that they paid for it with green pennies. There seemed to be no horses or animals of any kind. The men carried things around in little green carts, which they pushed before them. Everyone seemed happy and contented and prosperous. The guardian of the gates led them through the streets until they came to a big building, exactly in the middle of the city, which was the Palace of Oz, the Great Wizard. There was a soldier before the door, dressed in a green uniform and wearing a long green beard. Here are strangers, said the guardian of the gates to him, and they demand to see the Great Oz. Step inside, answered the soldier, and I will carry your message to him. So they passed through the palace gates and were led into a big room with a green carpet and lovely green furniture set with emeralds. The soldier made them all wipe their feet upon a green mat before entering the room, and when they were seated he said politely, Please make yourselves comfortable while I go to the door of the throne room and tell Oz you are here. They had to wait a long time before the soldier returned. When, at last, he came back, Dorothy asked, Have you seen Oz? Oh no, returned the soldier. I have never seen him. But I spoke to him as he sat behind his screen and gave him your message. He said he will grant you an audience if you so desire, but each one of you must enter his presence alone, and he will admit but one each day. Therefore, as you must remain in the palace for several days, I will have you shown to rooms where you may rest in comfort after your journey. Thank you, replied the girl. That is very kind of Oz. The soldier now blew upon a green whistle, and at once a young girl dressed in a pretty green silk gown entered the room. She had lovely green hair and green eyes, and she bowed low before Dorothy as she said, Follow me, and I will show you your room. So Dorothy said goodbye to all her friends except Toto, and taking the dog in her arms, followed the green girl through seven passages and up three flights of stairs till they came to a room at the front of the palace. It was the sweetest little room in the world, with a soft, comfortable bed that had sheets of green silk and a green velvet counterpane. There was a tiny fountain in the middle of the room that shot a spray of green perfume in the air, to fall back into a beautifully carved green marble basin. Beautiful green flowers stood in the windows, and there was a shelf with a row of little green books. When Dorothy had time to open these books, she found them all 
full of queer green pictures that made her laugh they were so funny in a wardrobe were many green dresses made of silk and satin and velvet and all of them fitted dorothy exactly make yourself perfectly at home said the green girl and if you wish for anything ring the bell oz will send for you tomorrow morning she left dorothy alone and went back to the others these she also led to rooms and each one of them found himself lodged in a very pleasant part of the palace of course this politeness was wasted on the scarecrow for when he found himself alone in his room he stood stupidly in one spot just within the doorway to wait till morning it would not rest him to lie down and he could not close his eyes so he remained all night staring at a little spider which was weaving its web in the corner of the room just as if it were not one of the most wonderful rooms in the world the tin woodman lay down on his bed from force of habit for he remembered when he was made of flesh but not being able to sleep he passed the night moving his joints up and down to make sure they were kept in good working order the lion would have preferred a bed of dried leaves in the forest and did not like being shut up in a room but he had too much sense to let this worry him so he sprang upon the bed and rolled himself into a cat and purred himself to sleep in a minute the next morning after breakfast the green maiden came to fetch dorothy and she dressed her in one of the prettiest gowns made of green brocaded satin dorothy put on a green silk apron and tied a green ribbon around toto's neck and they started for the throne room of the great oz first they came to a great hall in which were many ladies and gentlemen of the court all dressed in rich costumes these people had nothing to do but talk to each other but they always came to wait outside the throne room every morning although they were never permitted to see oz as dorothy entered they looked at her curiously and one of them whispered are you really going to look upon the face of oz the terrible of course answered the girl if he will see me oh he will see you said the soldier who had taken her message to the wizard although he does not like to have people ask to see him indeed at first he was angry and said i should send you back where you came from then he asked me what you looked like and when i mentioned your silver shoes he was very much interested at last i told him about the mark upon your forehead and he decided he would admit you to his presence just then a bell rang and the green girl said to dorothy that is the signal you must go to the throne room alone she opened a little door and dorothy walked boldly through and found herself in a wonderful place it was a big round room with a high arched roof and the walls and ceiling and floor were covered with large emeralds set closely together in the centre of the roof was a great light as bright as the sun which made the emeralds sparkle in a wonderful manner but what interested dorothy most was the big throne of green marble that stood in the middle of the room it was shaped like a chair and sparkled with gems as did everything else in the centre of the chair was an enormous head without a body to support it or any arms or legs whatever there was no hair upon this head but it had eyes and a nose and mouth and was much bigger than the head of the biggest giant as dorothy gazed upon this in wonder and fear the eyes turned slowly and looked sharply and steadily then the mouth moved and dorothy heard a voice say i am oz the great and terrible who are you and why do you seek me it was not such an awful voice as she had expected to come from the big head she, so she took courage and answered i am dorothy the small and meek i have come to you for help the eyes looked at her thoughtfully for a full minute then said the voice where did you get the silver shoes i got them from the wicked witch of the east when my house fell on her and killed her she replied where did you get the mark upon your forehead continued the voice that is where the good witch of the north kissed me when she bade me good-bye and sent me to you said the girl again the eyes looked at her sharply and they saw she was telling the truth then oz asked what do you wish me to do send me back to kansas where my aunt em and uncle henry are she answered earnestly i don't like your country although it is beautiful and i am sure aunt em will be dreadfully worried over my being away so long the eyes winked three times and then they turned up to the ceiling and down to the floor and rolled around so queerly that they seemed to be see every part of the room and at last they looked at dorothy again why should i do this for you asked oz because you are strong and i am weak because you are a great wizard and i am only a little girl but you were strong enough to kill the wicked witch of the east said oz that just happened returned dorothy simply i could not help it well said the head i will give you my answer you have no right to expect me to send you back to kansas unless you do something for me in return in this country every one must pay for everything he gets if you wish me to use my magic power to send you home again you must do something for me first help me and i will help you what must i do asked the girl kill the wicked witch of the west answered oz but i cannot exclaimed dorothy greatly surprised you killed the witch of the east and you wear the silver shoes which bear a powerful charm there is now but one wicked witch left in all this land and when you can tell me she is dead i will send you back to kansas but not before the little girl began to weep she was so much disappointed and the eyes winked again and looked upon her anxiously as if the great oz felt that she could help him if she would i never killed anything willingly she sobbed 
Even if I wanted to, how could I kill the Wicked Witch? If you, who are great and terrible, cannot kill yourself, how do you expect me to do it? I do not know, said the head, but that is my answer. But until the Wicked Witch dies, you will not see your uncle and aunt again. Remember that the witch is wicked, tremendously wicked, and ought to be killed. Now go, and do not ask to see me again until you have done your task. Sorrowfully, Dorothy left the throne room and went back where the lion and the scarecrow and the tin woodman were waiting to hear what Oz had said to her. There is no hope for me, she said, sadly, for Oz will not send me home until I have killed the Wicked Witch of the West, and that I can never do. Her friends were sorry, but could do nothing to help her. So Dorothy went to her own room and lay down on the bed and cried herself to sleep. The next morning the soldier with the green whiskers came to the scarecrow and said, Come with me, for Oz has sent for you. So the scarecrow followed him and was admitted into the great throne room, where he saw, sitting in the emerald throne, a most lovely lady. She was dressed in green silk gauze and wore upon her flowing green locks a crown of jewels. Growing from her shoulders were wings, gorgeous in color and so light that they fluttered if the slightest breath of air reached them. When the scarecrow had bowed as prettily as his straw stuffing would let him, before this beautiful creature, she looked upon him sweetly and said, I am Oz, the great and terrible. Who are you, and why do you seek me? Now the scarecrow, who had expected to see the great head Dorothy had told him of, was much astonished, but he answered her bravely. I am only a scarecrow stuffed with straw, therefore I have no brains, and I come to you praying that you will put brains in my head instead of straw, so that I might become as much a man as any other in your dominions. Why should I do this for you? asked the lady. Because you are wise and powerful, and no one else can help me, answered the scarecrow. I never grant favors without some return, said Oz. But this much I will promise. If you will kill for me the Wicked Witch of the West, I will bestow upon you a great many brains, and such good brains that you will be the wisest man in all the land of Oz. I thought you asked Dorothy to kill the witch, said the Scarecrow in surprise. So I did. I don't care who kills her, but until she is dead I will not grant your wish. Now go, and do not seek me again until you have earned the brains you so greatly desire. The Scarecrow went sorrowfully back to his friends and told them what Oz had said, and Dorothy was surprised to find that the Great Wizard was not ahead as she had seen him but a lovely lady. All the same, said the scarecrow, she needs a heart as much as the tin woodman. On the next morning, the soldier with the green whiskers came to the tin woman and said, Oz has sent for you. Follow me. So the tin woodman followed him and came to the great throne room. He did not know whether he would find Oz, a lovely lady or a head, but he hoped it would be a lovely lady. For, he said to himself, if it is the head, I am sure I shall not be given a heart, since a head is no heart of its own and therefore cannot feel for mine. But if it is the lovely lady, I shall beg hard for a heart, for all ladies are themselves said to be kindly hearted. But when the woodman entered the great throne room, he saw neither the head nor the lady, for Oz had taken the shape of a most terrible beast. It was nearly as big as an elephant, and the green throne seemed hardly strong enough to hold its weight. The beast had a head like that of a rhinoceros, only there were five eyes in its face. There were five long arms growing out of its body, and it also had five long slim legs. Thick woolly hair covered every part of it and a more dreadful-looking monster could not be imagined. It was fortunate the tin woodman had no heart at that moment, for it would have beat loud and fast from terror. But being only tin, the woodman was not at all afraid, although he was much disappointed. I am Oz, the great and terrible, spoke the beast in a voice that was one great roar. Who are you, and why do you seek me? I am a woodman made of tin. Therefore I have no heart and cannot love. I pray you to give me a heart, that I may be as other men are. Why should I do this? demanded the beast. Because I ask it, and you alone can grant my request, answered the woodman. Oz gave a low growl at this, but said gruffly, If you indeed desire a heart, you must earn it. How? asked the woodman. Help Dorothy to kill the Wicked Witch of the West, replied the beast. When the witch is dead, come to me, and I will then give you the biggest and kindest and most loving heart in all the land of Oz. So the tin woodman was forced to return sorrowfully to his friends and tell them of the terrible beast he had seen. They all wondered greatly at the many forms the great wizard could take upon himself. And the lion said, If he is a beast, when I go see him, I shall roar my loudest and so frighten him that he will grant all I ask. And if he is the lovely lady, I shall pretend to spring upon her and so compel her to do my bidding. And if he is the great head, he will be at my mercy, for I will roll this head all about the room until he promises to give us what we desire. So be of good cheer, my friends, for all will yet be well. The next morning the soldier with the green whiskers led the lion to the great throne room and bade him enter the presence of Oz. The lion at once passed through the door and glancing around saw to his surprise that before the throne was a ball of fire so fierce and glowing he could scarcely bear to gaze upon it his first thought was that oz had by accident caught on fire and was burning up but when he tried to go nearer the heat was so intense that it singed his whiskers and he crept back tremblingly to a spot nearer the door then a low quiet voice came from the ball of fire and these were the words it spoke 
I am Oz, the great and terrible. Who are you, and why do you seek me? And the lion answered, I am a cowardly lion, afraid of everything. I came to you to beg that you give me courage, so that in reality I may become the king of beasts, as men call me. Why should I give you courage? demanded Oz. Because of all wizards you are the greatest, and alone have the power to grant my request, answered the lion. The ball of fire burned fiercely for a time, and the voice said, Bring me proof that the wicked witch is dead, and that moment I will give you courage. But as long as the witch lives, you must remain a coward. The lion was angry at this speech, but could say nothing in reply. And while he stood silently gazing at the ball of fire, it became so furiously hot that he turned tail and rushed from the room. He was glad to find his friends waiting for him, and told them of his terrible interview with the wizard. What shall we do now? asked Dorothy sadly. There is only one thing we can do, returned the lion, and that is to go to the land of the Winkies, seek out the wicked witch, and destroy her. But suppose we cannot, said the girl. Then I shall never have courage, declared the lion. And I shall never have brains, added the scarecrow. And I shall never have a heart, spoke the tin woodman. And I shall never see Aunt Em and Uncle Henry, said Dorothy, beginning to cry. Be careful, cried the green girl. The tears will fall on your silk gown and spot it. So Dorothy dried her eyes and said, I suppose we must try it, but I'm sure I do not want to kill anybody, even to see Aunt Em again. I will go with you, but I'm too much of a coward to kill the witch, said the lion. I will go too, declared the scarecrow, but I shall not be much help to you, as I am such a fool. I haven't the heart to harm even a witch, remarked the tin woodman, but if you go, I certainly shall go with you. Therefore it was decided to start upon their journey the next morning, and the woodman sharpened his axe on a green grindstone, and had all of his joints properly oiled. The scarecrow stuffed himself with fresh straw, and Dorothy put new paint on his eyes that he might see better. The green girl, who was very kind to them, filled Dorothy's basket with good things to eat, and fastened a little bell around Toto's neck with a green ribbon. They went to bed quite early and slept soundly until daylight, when they were awakened by the crowing of a green cock that lived in the backyard of the palace, and the cackling of a hen that had laid a green egg. Chapter 12 The Search for the Wicked Witch the soldier with the green whiskers led them through the streets of the emerald city until they reached the room where the guardian of the gates lived this officer unlocked their spectacles and put them back in his great box and then he politely opened the gate for our friends which road leads to the wicked witch of the west asked dorothy there is no road answered the guardian of the gates no one ever wishes to go that way how then are we to find her inquired the girl that will be easy replied the man for when she knows you are in the country of the winkies she will find you and make you all her slaves perhaps not said the scarecrow for we mean to destroy her oh that is different said the guardian of the gates no one has ever destroyed her before so i naturally thought she would make slaves of you as she has of the rest but take care for she is wicked and fierce and may not allow you to destroy her keep to the west where the sun sets and you cannot fail to find her they thanked him and bade him good-bye and turned toward the west walking over the fields of soft grass dotted here and there with daisies and buttercups dorothy still wore the pretty silk dress she had put on the palace but now to her surprise she found it was no longer green but pure white the ribbon around toto's neck had also lost its green color and was as white as dorothy's dress the emerald city was soon left far behind as they advanced the ground became rougher and hillier for there were no farms nor houses in this country of the west and the ground was untilled in the afternoon the sun shone hot in their faces for there were no trees to offer them shade so that before night dorothy and toto and the lion were tired and lay down upon the grass and fell asleep with the woodman and scarecrow keeping watch now the wicked witch of the west had but one eye yet that was as powerful as a telescope and she could see everywhere so as she sat in the door of her castle she happened to look around and saw dorothy lying asleep with her friends all about her they were a long distance off but the wicked witch was angry to find them in her country so she blew upon a silver whistle that hung around her neck at once there came running to her from all directions a pack of great wolves they had long legs and fierce eyes and sharp teeth go to those people said the witch and tear them to pieces are you not going to make them your slaves asked the leader of the wolves no she answered one is of tin and one of straw one is a girl and another a lion none of them is fit to work so you may tear them into small pieces very well said the wolf and he dashed away at full speed followed by the others it was lucky the scarecrow and the woodman were wide awake and heard the wolves coming this is my fight said the woodman so get behind me and i will meet them as they come he seized his axe which he had made very sharp and as the leader of the wolves came on the tin woodman swung his arm and chopped the wolf's head from its body so that it immediately died as soon as he could raise his axe another wolf came up and he also fell into the sharp edge of the tin woodman's weapon there were forty wolves and forty times a wolf was killed so that at last they all lay dead in a heap before the woodman then he put down his axe and sat beside the scarecrow who said it was a good fight friend they waited until dorothy awoke the next morning the little girl was quite frightened when she saw the great pile of shaggy wolves but the tin woodman told her all she thanked him for saving them and sat down to breakfast 
after which they started again upon their journey now the same morning the wicked witch came to the door of her castle and looked out with her one eye that could see far off she saw all her wolves lying dead and the strangers still travelling through her country this made her angrier than before and she blew her silver whistle twice straightway a great flock of wild crows came flying toward her enough to darken the sky and the wicked witch said to the king crow fly at once to the strangers peck out their eyes and tear them to pieces the wild crows flew in one great flock toward dorothy and her companions when the little girl saw them coming she was afraid but the scarecrow said this is my battle so lie down beside me and you will not be harmed so they all lay upon the ground except the scarecrow and he stood up and stretched out his arms and when the crows saw him they were frightened as these birds are always frightened by scarecrows and did not dare to come any nearer but the king crow said it is only a stuffed man i will peck his eyes out the king crow flew at the scarecrow who caught it by the head and twisted its neck until it died and then another crow flew at him and the scarecrow twisted its neck also there were forty crows and forty times the scarecrow twisted a neck until at last all were lying dead beside him then he called to his companions to rise and again they went upon their journey when the wicked witch looked out again and saw all her crows lying in a heap she got into a terrible rage and blew three times upon her silver whistle forthwith there was heard a great buzzing in the air and a swarm of black bees came flying toward her go to the strangers and sting them to death commanded the witch and the bees turned and flew rapidly until they came to where dorothy and her friends were walking but the woodman had seen them coming and the scarecrow had decided what to do take out my straw and scatter it over the little girl and the dog and the lion he said to the woodman and the bees cannot sting them this the woodman did and as dorothy lay close beside the lion and held toto in her arms the straw covered them entirely the bees came and found no one but the woodman to sting so they flew at him and broke off all their stings against the tin without hurting the woodman at all and as bees cannot live when their stings are broken that was the end of the black bees and they lay scattered thick about the woodman like little heaps of fine coal then dorothy and the lion got up and the girl helped the tin woodman put the straw back into the scarecrow again until he was as good as ever so they started upon their journey once more the wicked witch was so angry when she saw her black bees in little heaps like fine coal that she stamped her foot and tore her hair and gnashed her teeth then she called a dozen of her slaves who were the winkies and gave them sharp spears telling them to go to the strangers and destroy them the winkies were not a brave people but they had to do as they were told so they marched away until they came near to dorothy then the lion gave a great roar and sprang towards them and the poor winkies were so frightened that they ran back as fast as they could when they returned to the castle the wicked witch beat them well with a strap and sent them back to their work after which she sat down to think what she should do next she could not understand how all her plans to destroy these strangers had failed but she was a powerful witch as well as a wicked one and she soon made up her mind how to act there was in her cupboard a golden cap with a circle of diamonds and rubies running around it this golden cap had a charm whoever owned it could call three times upon the winged monkeys who would obey any order they were given but no person could command these strange creatures more than three times twice already the wicked witch had used the charm of the cap once was when she had made the winkies her slaves and set herself up to rule over the country the winged monkeys had helped her do this the second time was when she had fought against the great oz himself and driven him out of the land of the west the winged monkeys had also helped her in doing this only once more could she use this golden cap for which reason she did not like to do so until all her other powers were exhausted but now that her fierce wolves and wild crows and her stinging bees were gone and her slaves had been scared away by the cowardly lion she saw there was only one way left to destroy dorothy and her friends so the wicked witch took the golden cap from her cupboard and placed it upon her head then she stood upon her left foot and said eat pee pep pee cat key next she stood upon her right foot and said hi lo ho lo hello after this she stood upon both feet and cried in a loud voice ziz zee zuz zee zick now the charm began to work the sky was darkened and a low rumbling sound was heard in the air there was a rushing of many wings a great chattering and laughing and the sun came out of the dark sky to show the wicked witch surrounded by a crowd of monkeys each with a pair of immense and powerful wings on his shoulders one much bigger than the other seemed to be their leader he flew close to the witch and said you have called us for the third and last time what do you command go to the strangers who are within my land and destroy them all except the lion said the wicked witch bring that beast to me for i have a mind to harness him like a horse and make him work your commands shall be obeyed said the leader then with a great deal of chattering and noise the winged monkeys flew away to the place where dorothy and her friends were walking some of the monkeys seized the tin woodman and carried him through the air until they were over a country thickly covered with sharp rocks here they dropped the poor woodman who fell a great distance to the rocks where he lay so battered and dented that he could neither move nor groan others of the monkeys caught the scarecrow and with their long fingers pulled all of the straw out of his clothes and head they made his hat and boots and clothes into a small bundle and threw it into the top branches of a tall tree the remaining monkeys threw pieces of a stout rope around the lion and wound many coils around his body and head and legs until he was unable to bite or scratch or struggle in any way 
Then they lifted him up and flew away with him to the witch's castle, where he was placed in a small yard with a high iron fence around it, so that he could not escape. But Dorothy they did not harm at all. She stood with Toto in her arms, watching the sad fate of her comrades, and thinking it would soon be her turn. The leader of the winged monkeys flew up to her, his long hairy arms stretched out and his ugly face grinning terribly, but he saw the mark of the good witch's kiss upon her forehead and stopped short, motioning the others not to touch her. We dare not harm this little girl, he said to them, for she is protected by the power of good, and that is greater than the power of evil. All we can do is carry her to the castle of the wicked witch and leave her there. So, carefully and gently, they lifted Dorothy in their arms and carried her swiftly through the air until they came to the castle, where they set her down upon the front doorstep. Then the leader said to the witch, We have obeyed you as far as we were able. The tin woodman and the scarecrow are destroyed, and the lion is tied up in your yard. The little girl we dare not harm, nor the dog she carries in her arms. Your power over our band is now ended, and you will never see us again. Then all the winged monkeys, with much laughing and chattering and noise, flew into the air and were soon out of sight. The wicked witch was both surprised and worried when she saw the mark on Dorothy's forehead, for she knew well that neither the winged monkeys nor she herself dare hurt the girl in any way. She looked down at Dorothy's feet, and seeing the silver shoes, began to tremble with fear for she knew what a powerful charm belonged to them. At first the witch was tempted to run away from Dorothy, but she happened to look into the child's eyes and saw how simple the soul behind them was, and that the little girl did not know of the wonderful power the silver shoes gave her. So the wicked witch laughed to herself and thought, I could still make her my slave, for she does not know how to use her power. Then she said to Dorothy, harshly and severely, Come with me and see that you mind everything I tell you, for if you do not, I will make an end of you, as I did of the tin woodman and the scarecrow. Dorothy followed her through many of the beautiful rooms of her castle until they came to the kitchen, where the witch bade her clean the pots and kettles and sweep the floor and keep the fire fed with wood. Dorothy went to work meekly, with her mind made up to work as hard as she could, for she was glad the wicked witch had decided not to kill her. With Dorothy hard at work, the witch thought she would go into a courtyard and harness the cowardly lion like a horse. It would amuse her, she was sure, to make him draw her chariot whenever she wished to go to drive. But as she opened the gate, the lion gave a loud roar and bounded at her so fiercely that the witch was afraid and ran out and shut the gate again. If I cannot harness you, said the witch to the lion, speaking through the bars of the gate, I can starve you. You shall have nothing to eat until you do as I wish. So after that, she took no food to the imprisoned lion. But every day she came to the gate at noon and asked, Are you ready to be harnessed like a horse? And the lion would answer, No, if you come in this yard, I will bite you. The reason the lion did not have to do as the witch wished was that every night while the woman was asleep, Dorothy carried him food from the cupboard. After he had eaten, he would lie down on his bed of straw, and Dorothy would lie beside him and put her head on his soft, shaggy mane while they talked of their troubles and tried to plan some way to escape. But they could find no way to get out of the castle, for it was constantly guarded by the yellow winkies, who were the slaves of the wicked witch, and too afraid of her not to do as she told them. The girl had to work hard during the day, and often the witch threatened to beat her with the same old umbrella she always carried in her hand. But in truth, she did not dare to strike Dorothy, because of the mark upon her forehead. The child did not know this, and was full of fear for herself and Toto. Once the witch struck Toto with a blow with her umbrella, and the brave little dog flew at her and bit her leg in return. The witch did not bleed where she was bitten, for she was so wicked that the blood in her had dried up many years before. Dorothy's life became very sad as she grew to understand that it would be harder than ever to get back to Kansas and Aunt Em again. Sometimes she would cry bitterly for hours, with Toto sitting at her feet and looking into her face, whining dismally to show how sorry he was for his little mistress. Toto did not really care whether he was in Kansas or the Land of Oz so long as Dorothy was with him, but he knew the little girl was unhappy, and that made him unhappy too. Now the Wicked Witch had a great longing to have for her own the silver shoes which the girl always wore. Her bees and her crows and her wolves were lying in heaps and drying up, and she had used up all the power of the golden cap, but if she could only get hold of the silver shoes, they would give her more power than all the other things she had lost. She watched Dorothy carefully to see if she ever took off her shoes, thinking she might steal them. But the child was so proud of her pretty shoes that she never took them off except at night and when she took her bath. The witch was too much afraid of the dark to dare to go into Dorothy's room at night to take the shoes, and her dread of water was greater than her fear of the dark. So she never came near when Dorothy was bathing. Indeed, the old witch never touched water, nor ever let water touch her in any way. But the wicked creature was very cunning, and she finally thought of a trick that would give her what she wanted. She placed a bar of iron in the middle of the kitchen floor, and then by her magic arts made the iron invisible to human eyes so that when Dorothy walked across the floor she stumbled over the bar, not being able to see it, and fell at full length. She was not much hurt, but in her fall one of the silver shoes came off, and before she could reach it the witch had snatched it away and put it on her own skinny foot. The wicked woman was greatly pleased with the success of her trick, for as long as she had one of the shoes she owned half the power of their charm, and Dorothy could not use it against her, even had she known how to do so. The little girl, 
seeing she had lost one of her pretty shoes grew angry and said to the witch give me back my shoe i will not retorted the witch for it is now my shoe and not yours you are a wicked creature cried dorothy you have no right to take my shoe from me i shall keep it just the same said the witch laughing at her and some day i shall get the other one from you too this made dorothy so very angry that she picked up the bucket of water that stood near and dashed it over the witch wetting her from head to foot instantly the wicked woman gave a loud cry of fear and then as dorothy looked at her in wonder the witch began to shrink and fall away see what you have done she screamed in a minute i shall melt away i'm very sorry indeed said dorothy who was truly frightened to see the witch actually melting away like brown sugar before her very eyes didn't you know water would be the end of me asked the witch in a wailing despairing voice of course not answered dorothy how should i well in a few minutes i shall be all melted and you will have the castle to yourself i have been wicked in my day but i never thought a little girl like you would ever be able to melt me and end my wicked deeds look out here i go with those words the witch fell down in a brown melted shapeless mass and began to spread over the clean boards of the kitchen floor seeing that she had really melted away to nothing dorothy drew another bucket of water and threw it over the mess she then swept it all out the door after picking out the silver shoe which was all that was left of the old woman she cleaned and dried it with cloth and put it on her foot again then being at last free to do as she chose she ran out to the courtyard to tell the lion that the wicked witch of the west had come to an end and that they were no longer prisoners in a strange land end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the wonderful wizard of oz by l frank baum this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by w blaine dowler originally released through bureau forty two chapter thirteen the rescue the cowardly lion was much pleased to hear that the wicked witch had been melted by a bucket of water and dorothy at once unlocked the gate of his prison and set him free they went in together to the castle where dorothy's first act was to call all the winkies together and tell them that they were no longer slaves there was great rejoicing among the yellow winkies for they had been made to work hard during many years for the wicked witch who had always treated them with great cruelty they kept this day as a holiday then and ever after and spent the time in feasting and dancing if our friends the scarecrow and the tin woodman were only with us said the lion i should be quite happy don't you suppose we could rescue them asked the girl anxiously we can try answered the lion so they called the yellow winkies and asked them if they would help to rescue their friends and the winkies said that they would be delighted to do all in their power for dorothy who had set them free from bondage so she chose a number of the winkies who looked as if they knew the most and they all started away they travelled that day and part of the next until they came to the rocky plain where the tin woodman lay all battered and bent his axe was near him but the blade was rusted and the handle was broken off short the winkies lifted him tenderly in their arms and carried him back to the yellow castle again dorothy shedding a few tears by the way at the sad plight of her old friend and the lion looking sober and sorry when they reached the castle dorothy said to the winkies are any of your people tinsmiths oh yes some of us are very good tinsmiths they told her then bring them to me she said and when the tinsmiths came bringing with them all their tools and baskets she inquired can you straighten out those dents in the tin woodman and bend him back into shape again and solder him together where he is broken the tinsmiths looked the woodman over carefully and then answered that they thought they could mend him so he would be as good as ever so they set to work in one of the big yellow rooms of the castle and worked for three days and four nights hammering and twisting and bending and soldering and polishing and pounding at the legs and body and head of the tin woodman until at last he was straightened out to his old form and his joints worked as well as ever to be sure there were several patches on him but the tinsmiths did a good job and as the woodman was not a vain man he did not mind the patches at all when at last he walked into dorothy's room and thanked her for rescuing him he was so pleased that he wept tears of joy and dorothy had to wipe every tear carefully from his face with her apron so his joints would not be rusted at the same time her own tears fell thick and fast at the joy of meeting her old friend again and these tears did not need to be wiped away as for the lion he wiped his eyes so often with the tip of his tail that it became quite wet and he was obliged to go out into the courtyard and hold it in the sun till it dried if we only had the scarecrow with us again said the tin woodman when dorothy had finished telling him everything that had happened i should be quite happy we must try to find him said the girl so she called the winkies to help her and they walked all that day and part of the next until they came to the tall tree in the branches of which the wink monkeys had tossed the scarecrow's clothes it was a very tall tree and the trunk was so smooth that no one could climb it but the woodman said at once i'll chop it down and then we can get the scarecrow's clothes now while the tinsmiths had been at work mending the woodman himself another of the winkies who was a goldsmith had made an axe handle of solid gold and fitted it to the woodman's axe instead of the old broken handle others polished the blade until all the rest was removed and it glistened like burnished silver as soon as he had spoken the tin woodman began to chop 
and in a short time the tree fell over with a crash whereupon the scarecrow's clothes fell out of the branches and rolled off on the ground dorothy picked them up and had the winkies carry them back to the castle where they were stuffed with the nice clean straw and behold here was the scarecrow as good as ever thanking them over and over again for saving him now that they were reunited dorothy and her friends spent a few happy days at the yellow castle where they found everything they needed to make them comfortable but one day the girl thought of aunt em and said we must go back to oz and claim his promise yes said the woodman at last i shall get my heart and i shall get my brains added the scarecrow joyfully and i shall get my courage said the lion thoughtfully and i shall get back to kansas cried dorothy clapping her hands oh let us start for the emerald city to-morrow this they decided to do the next day they called the winkies together and bade them good-bye the winkies were sorry to have them go and they had grown so fond of the tin woodman that they begged him to stay and rule over them in the yellow land of the west finding they were determined to go the winkies gave toto and the lion each a golden collar and to dorothy they presented a beautiful bracelet studded with diamonds and to the scarecrow they gave a gold-headed walking stick to keep him from stumbling and to the tin woodman they offered a silver oil can inlaid with gold and set with precious jewels every one of the travellers made the winkies a pretty speech in return and all shook hands with them until their arms ached dorothy went to the witch's cupboard to fill her basket with food for the journey and there she saw the golden cap she tried it on her own head and found that it fitted her exactly she did not know anything about the charm of the golden cap but she saw that it was pretty so she made up her mind to wear it and carry her sunbonnet in the basket then being prepared for the journey they all started for the emerald city and the winkies gave them three cheers and many good wishes to carry with them chapter fourteen the winged monkeys you will remember there was no road not even a pathway between the castle of the wicked witch and the emerald city when the four travellers went in search of the witch she had seen them coming and so sent the winged monkeys to bring them to her it was much harder to find their way back through the big fields of buttercups and yellow daisies than it was being carried they knew of course they must go straight east toward the rising sun and they started off in the right way but at noon when the sun was over their heads they did not know which was east and which was west and that was the reason they were lost in the great fields they kept on walking however and at night the moon came out and shone brightly so they lay down among the sweet-smelling yellow flowers and slept soundly until morning all but the scarecrow and the tin woodman the next morning the sun was behind a cloud but they started on as if they were quite sure which way they were going if we walk far enough said dorothy i'm sure we shall some time come to some place but day by day passed away and they still saw nothing before them but the scarlet fields the scarecrow began to grumble a bit we have surely lost our way he said and unless we find it again in time to reach the emerald city i shall never get my brains nor i my heart declared the tin woodman it seems to me i can scarcely wait till i get to oz and you must admit this is a very long journey you see said the cowardly lion with a whimper i haven't the courage to keep tramping forever without getting anywhere at all then dorothy lost heart she sat down on the grass and looked at her companions and they sat down and looked at her and toto found that for the first time in his life he was too tired to chase a butterfly that flew past his head so he put out his tongue and panted and looked at dorothy as if to ask what they should do next suppose we call the field mice she suggested they could probably tell us the way to the emerald city to be sure they could cried the scarecrow why didn't we think of that before dorothy blew the little whistle she had always carried about her neck since the queen of the mice had given it to her in a few minutes they heard the pattering of tiny feet and many of the small gray mice came running up to her among them was the queen herself who asked in her squeaky little voice what can i do for my friends we have lost our way said dorothy can you tell us where the emerald city is certainly answered the queen but it is a great way off for you have had it at your backs all this time then she noticed dorothy's golden cap and said why don't you use the charm of the cap and call the winged monkeys to you they will carry you to the city of oz in less than an hour i didn't know there was a charm answered dorothy in surprise what is it it is written inside the golden cap replied the queen of the mice but if you are going to call the winged monkeys we must run away for they are full of mischief and think it great fun to plague us won't they hurt me asked the girl anxiously oh no they must obey the wearer of the cap good-bye and she scampered out of sight with all the mice hurrying after her dorothy looked inside the golden cap and saw some words written upon the lining these she thought must be the charm so she read the directions carefully and put the cap on her head ep pee pet pee cat pee she said standing on her left foot what did you say asked the scarecrow who did not know what she was doing hi lo ho lo hello dorothy went on standing this time on her right foot hello replied the tin woodman calmly ziz zee zuz zee zick said dorothy who was now standing on both feet this ended the saying of the charm and they heard the great chattering and flapping of wings as the band of winged monkeys flew up to them the king bowed low before dorothy and said what is your command we wish to go to the emerald city said the child and we have lost our way we will carry you replied the king and no sooner had he spoken than two of the monkeys caught dorothy in their arms and flew away with her others took the scarecrow and the woodman and the lion and one little monkey seized toto and flew after them although the dog tried hard to bite him 
The Scarecrow and the Tin Woodman were rather frightened at first, for they remembered how badly the winged monkeys had treated them before. But they saw that no harm was intended, so they rode through the air quite cheerfully and had a fine time looking at the pretty gardens and woods far below. Dorothy found herself riding easily between two of the biggest monkeys, one of them the king himself. They had made a chair in their hands and were careful not to hurt her. Why do you have to obey the charm of the golden cap? she asked. That is a long story, answered the king with a winged laugh. But as we have a long journey before us, I will pass the time by telling you about it if you wish. I shall be glad to hear it, she replied. Once, began the leader, we were a free people, living happily in the great forest, flying from tree to tree, eating nuts and fruit, and just doing as we pleased without calling anybody master. Perhaps some of us were rather too full of mischief at times, flying down to pull the tails of the animals that had no wings, chasing birds, and throwing nuts at the people who walked in the forest. But we were careless and happy and full of fun, and enjoyed every minute of the day. This was many years ago, long before Oz came out of the clouds to rule over this land. There lived here then, away at the north, a beautiful princess who was also a powerful sorceress. All her magic was used to help the people, and she was never known to hurt anyone who was good. Her name was Galat, and she lived in a handsome palace built from great blocks of ruby. Everyone loved her, but her greatest sorrow was that she could find no one to love in return, since all the men were much too stupid and ugly to mate with one so beautiful and wise. At last, however, she found a boy who was handsome and manly and wise beyond his years. Galette made up her mind that, when he grew to be a man, she would make him her husband. So she took him to a ruby palace and used all her magic powers to make him as strong and good and lovely as any woman could wish. When he grew to manhood, Quilala, as he was called, was said to be the best and wisest man in all the land, while his manly beauty was so great that Galette loved him dearly and hastened to make everything ready for the wedding. My grandfather was at that time the king of the winged monkeys which lived in the forest near Galet's palace, and the old fellow loved a joke better than a good dinner. One day, just before the wedding, my grandfather was flying out with his band when he saw Quilala walking beside the river. He was dressed in a rich costume of pink silk and purple velvet, and my grandfather thought he would see what he could do. At his word, the band flew down and seized Quilala, carried him in their arms until they were over the middle of the river, and then dropped him into the water. Swim out, my fine fellow, cried my grandfather, and see if the water has spotted your clothes. Quilala was much too wise not to swim, and he was not the least spoiled by all his good fortune. He laughed when he came to the top of the water and swam into shore. But when Gaelette came running out to him, she found his silks and velvet all ruined by the river. The princess was angry, and she knew, of course, who did it. She had all the winged monkeys brought before her, and she said at first that all the rings should be tied, and they should be treated as they had treated Quilala, and dropped in the river. But my grandfather pleaded hard, for he knew the monkeys would drown in the river with their wings tied, and Quilala said a kind word for them also so that Galette finally spared them, on condition that the winged monkeys should ever after do three times the bidding of the owner of the golden cap. This cap had been made for a wedding present to Quilala, and it is said to have cost the princess half her kingdom. Of course, my grandfather and all the other monkeys at once agreed to this condition, and that is how it happens that we are three times the slaves of the owner of the golden cap, whosoever he may be. And what became of them? asked Dorothy, who had been greatly interested in the story. Quilala being the first owner of the golden cap, replied the monkey, he was the first to lay his wishes upon us. As his bride could not bear the sight of us, he called us all to him in the forest after he had married her, and ordered us always to keep where she could never again set eyes on a winged monkey, which we were glad to do, for we were all afraid of her. This was all we ever had to do until the golden cap fell into the hands of the Wicked Witch of the West, who made us enslave the Winkies, and afterward drive Oz himself out of the land of the West. Now the golden cap is yours, and three times you have the right to lay your wishes upon us. As the Monkey King finished his story, Dorothy looked down and saw the green, shining walls of the Emerald City before them. She wondered at the rapid flight of the monkeys, but was glad the journey was over. The strange creatures set the travelers down carefully before the gate of the city, and the king bowed low to Dorothy, and then flew swiftly away, followed by all his band. That was a good ride, said the little girl. Yes, and a quick way out of our troubles, replied the lion. How lucky it was you brought away that wonderful cap. End of chapter 14